All right, PWM, welcome to 2022 business planning. We have um, a few of our professionals here. We have Robert talking about team building. Doug and Pitt are going to talk about doing loans. And most of you guys are online. So we have a few people in the office who I'm not going to be talking to. I'll be talking to people online. Um, and we're excited to talk about what the next year looks for, for or looks like for you guys. So um, before we get started, I want everybody to have laptop outs with an open Google Doc or a pen and pad if you're like Pitt. Um, but everybody else, laptop out with an open Google Doc, and we want to take down um, your goals for 2022. So a few things that I want to fill out before we actually get started are what 2021 looked like for you. So let's do four categories. I want to do loans closed in 2021, your actual goal for 2021 of loans closed, and then people that you brought onto the company in 2021, and also your goal for that. And we're going to bring Doug and Pitt up here, and they're going to talk about their 2021 goal um, and how people, whether they achieved it, where they came short, uh, for the loans and for team building. So um, I'm going to bring these guys up. And the first thing I'm going to ask them to do, sorry, we got a little echo here. The first thing I'm going to ask them to do is describe their first six to 12 months in this industry. Um, a lot of us are brand spanking new to this. Uh, we've been doing this, you know, some of us five years, some of us, this was our first year, or we just got licensed in the last six months. And in 2022 is really going to be our first year in the industry. So I'm going to have Doug um, and Pitt come up and talk about that and we'll get it going. All right. So Doug, why don't you start us off? What, what did your first six to 12 months in the industry look like? Uh, my first six months was a lot of work and not a lot of loans yet, right? So my strategy was developing an empire of business partners and developing a lot of people that I could go to to network with to start feeding me business. And so my first six months was a lot of blood, sweat, and tears, putting my name out there, going to networking events, picking up the phone, cold calling, doing a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about during our meeting when you're trying to strategize your week and how to put your name out there the right way. And so I didn't really close a lot. My first year, I think I made, I made between 60 and 70 grand total in my closed loans. And I worked harder than I did at my last job, right, that year. But I knew I was just getting started, right? I knew that I was following the strategies of seven-figure producing loan officers. And I knew that if I stayed the course, that I'd be able to double, triple that income easily in the next few years, which I ended up doing. And so I think a lot of success when it comes to the networking side of things is understanding that it's going to take time. And you have to be committed to doing the little things to create the big growth when enough time goes by. Mr. Pitt. Well, I'll take you back to uh, 1988, the fall of 1988. That's when I started. Yeah, it was a great year. Wonder who won the Super Bowl that year. It was really interesting when I started. I, I started with a local company, Capital Commerce Mortgage, and I spent that first couple of weeks learning. Um, because I realized I, I didn't even know what an impound account was on a loan. I didn't know anything about loans, you guys. So I sat with the underwriters for a week. That was exciting. I sat with our closing department. We were a mortgage bank at that time. And when I did go out in the field, I felt like I, I had a little bit more understanding of what the process was that I was putting people through. Um, I, I made, I know what I made, I don't know how many loans I did, but I know what I made because I still have the W-2. I made $37,000 that first year and uh, I I'm, was excited to do that. But it's really interesting, you guys. If I had to do it over again, I do the same thing by learning the skills, by going and sitting with underwriting back then and sitting with the closing team. And then uh, Bob Lagren, uh, a great loan officer out in Woodland, California. Um, I went and shadowed him for two days and drove him around. And I think those things brought my skill level up to where when I went out there, I could start doing loans. So 1988, baby. Well, I think it's important to note that Pitt and I started at zero, right? Like we started in this, we weren't handed anything. All I had was a CD from a top producing loan officer. And he said, this is how you organize your week. And this is how you talk to business partners. And I just took that to the streets. I'm like, man, I'm gonna borrow that dude's confidence. I'm going to do what he does because he's already invented the wheel. It's going. So I'm just going to follow that strategy to get me there. And that same strategy is a strategy that we're going to be going over today in this meeting about how to structure your week, month, year for success. 
All right, well, before we have Robert bring, uh, come up and talk about team building, I'm going to put you guys on the spot a little bit. So grab a marker there for me, and everybody at home, uh, go ahead and play along with us. So I want to know, fast forward 2021, I think you've been doing this for 106 years, <laughs> done, what, six or seven years, okay? How many loans did you close in 2021? Hmm. And hey, if you're at home, go ahead and write that on your board or uh, in, in your uh, doc. Why don't you put that in the chat as well? All right, 108 and 176. So these are guys that made, Pitt made $37,000 in his first year. Doug made about 60. Uh, and Pitt closed 108 loans in 2021. If I do the quick math on that, probably $40 million in volume. What is that, about $500,000? Uh, Doug did 176. The quick math on that is close to a million dollars if you want to see Doug's W-2. Um, what was your goal in 2021? Did you have a goal? Do you even set goals anymore this late in your career? <laughs> What was your 2021 goal? You have to set goals. You always have to set goals. Very, very interesting. I'm going to put my number up first. It's an interesting number. 97. Yeah. Where'd that come from? Just the number that I calculated I wanted to do. I actually just wanted to do 150 this year. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. So these, both these guys have been in the industry for longer than a year and they had goals for 2021. So how about the other side of our company? How many people did you actually recruit? Active loan officers, not team builders, but active loan officers. How many people did you bring on to our company? Right now. This year or this past year? Well, so did you have a goal for that? Did. My goal is 12. My goal is 15. So these guys both set goals for both sides of it, right? The industry as far as setting, as far as closing the loans, but also um, the side of it of bringing people into the company. So we're gonna bring Robert up now, and Robert is gonna talk to us about how we can be more successful in recruiting LOs in 2022. Now, real quick, I wanna add guys that I know you're out there, you wanna grind, you wanna grow. You will get to a point in your business where you don't have to work so hard to get a lot of volume. Once you volume up and you get all those business partners, you get this massive database of people. I mean, I'm kind of on cruise control at this point. I haven't like actively gone out to try and grow my business since about six months into PWM because I'm focused on PWM this year pit as well. And so a lot of these numbers are our just, we're just cruising. We're following up with our people. But you just, just, there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Your first three years in the industry will be the most difficult. You're going to have to talk to the most strangers those first three years. But eventually, you're going to find a big group of people that are your people. And at that point, it's just keeping up relationships, it's whining and dining to keep the flow going. So this is just, these are flow numbers, right? I didn't even want to grow this year, my personal production. I wanted to grow PWM. That was my goal. So this is just cruising right now. And I want you guys to understand that because sometimes you think, man, I got to do this forever my entire career. You don't. Do it your first three or four years, grow your empire, and it's going to get a lot easier. Love that message. I think the only thing that I want to say is uh, we're in the month of December, and so you're here in December, and you really have two choices, maybe three, but you have two choices. You have choice number one, I'm Doug, I did 176 loans so far this year, I'm just going to take the rest of the year off. And you could be in that mindset, and, and he could do that. But knowing Doug, he's not doing that. The most important thing to take from today, you guys, is next year starts today. What you do here in December through the holidays, that's going to set you up. If you do nothing, I can guarantee you, you're going to have a terrible January if you do nothing. So I know it's been a great year for a lot of people. For those of you that are new or experienced, keep going through the holidays. Maybe change it up how you're doing it, but do not take the rest of the month off because that will really kill you at the beginning of the year. And we've seen people do that, haven't we? Oh, 100%. And, just, and this is the kind of slower time of year traditionally, right? November through February, it's kind of a little slower. So people either take vacations or they get down and they start sharpening their pencils and figuring out who do I want to be in 2022? Who do I want to be? And starting that now. And I love that. Who do I want to be? I want to be Doug Ross. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's give a hand to Robert Duncan. Is it my portion? Oh, okay. All right.
How's everyone? Good? Excellent. You know, one of the most important things that uh, I wanted to talk about today is putting on a very different type of hat. Okay. When I used to close tons of deals myself as a producer, you know, I, I had a certain angle. And one of the most important things to understand is you got to understand that that there's the angle of being a top producer and then there's the angle of being an owner or a builder see the top producer angle did not get me to leave my current course in my life because my current course in my life i grew up wanting to be or thinking i was going to be a doctor Okay, when you come from a family where you're the only child and both parents are somewhat in the medical field, you know, you, you grow up thinking that you're going to be a doctor. You grow up thinking that, that you go to school to become a doctor, you get the best grades to become a doctor, you go to the best uh, school. I went to Davis and, and you go to Davis taking pre-med because you want to be a doctor. Okay, when I found real estate so i found real estate before i found mortgages but when i found real estate that did not distract me from wanting to be a doctor okay i was still hey i was doing real estate i was starting to do really good but i was still in school i was still taking all the pre-med courses because i was still wanting to be a doctor but something changed two years into being in real estate something changed okay it wasn't being a top producer that changed my course in my life. It was two years into the business, I'm like around 20 years old, I was given and I gave myself the opportunity to become an owner. And I told myself, is it worth it to give up good for great? Is it worth it to do that? And the thing that got me to make that decision you know, I know it's in the book, Think and Grow Rich. I know one of the people here loves that book. And, and, and I actually got the, I actually got that idea because I don't think that book was out at that time. I got that idea from a, from a book that I had read at that time and someone told me to read it. And, and the book was from Napoleon Hill. Okay. And, and that book said, and it told all the little stories it said all, it had all those little stories about how people, the billionaires achieve. All right, how all the billionaires achieve. And I was, I was thinking to myself, and I did some numbers. I remember I was sitting there at 7 p.m. I remember the time. I was sitting there at 7 p.m. And I wrote down some numbers. It was not the numbers that I got from being a producer. It was the numbers I got, and it was the very first time ever I had put ownership numbers in front of me. I put ownership numbers in front of me. And sometimes it's very powerful to really understand ownership numbers. All I did was I put down the number 10. I put down the number 10. And I said to myself, I said, right now, if I started a company, okay, the numbers aren't always perfect, but you have to make the numbers simple enough to understand it. So all I did was put the number 10 down and I said, if I just had 10 people in my company that I can make $1,000 from, I would have $10,000. $10,000 times 12 is $120,000. At that time, that number was significant for me because I asked myself, I said, you know, I'm going to school right now. I'm at Davis. I'm in a class at 7 p.m. I'm turning down clients to show homes because I'm in my class right now as we speak. Okay, I'm in a such a fork in my life because my broker at the time is retiring. So in a month here, I'm gonna be looking for another place to hang my license. And so I said, I'm on a 10 year course right now. 
it's going to be 10 years until I become a full fledged doctor. I probably have another two and a half years to go for undergrad. I have another four years to go for medical school. I have another two years to go, two or three years to go for residency. And after 10 years, I'm going to be looking for that type of income as a doctor. Because when you start, that's about what you make. Back then, that was. I don't know what you make now. I haven't been following it. But about back then, that's how much I make. So my 10-year plan was this. So I asked myself on that day, and it was, it was an econ class, actually. And, and on that day, I asked myself, as the teacher was giving, I just remember specifically, as the teacher was giving his uh, lecture, I actually had a piece of paper, wrote down the number 10 times 1,000 to 10,000, dollars And I said, if I were able to start a company, how long would it take me to get 10 good people? And I could make $1,000 a month from 10 good people, and I could get that $10,000 a month income. If it took me less than 10 years, I'd be happy. But my goal was in one year. My goal was in one year. So one of the things that was very important to me was I, I, I wanted to see a vision and I gave myself 10 years to do it because I was already on a 10 year plan. It wasn't I was on a one month plan. Hey, I'm not trying to get rich right now. I was on a 10 year plan. Anyways, when you become an engineer, when you go to school for something, when your kids go to school for something, we're on a four year plan. We're on an eight year plan, depending on what how high level we want to be, we want to be attorney, we want to be a doctor, we want to be an engineer. We're on some type of plan. So I gave myself 10 years to get to the point I could get that. So then at that moment in time, I had a conversation with my parents that night and I said, well, I'm still going to go to school, but I want to give owning a business a shot. Instead of joining another company, I rented the room right next to the broker that was retiring. And I started my company at 20 with the very simple goal. Because sometimes our goals have to be pretty simple with the simple goal that I'm going to get in one year, hopefully close to this number, 12 people. You know, Pitt's number in the last year was 22 loan officers, Doug's was 12. Getting one a month made sense for me. Well, you know what? It's funny because when I started my company, you know how many agents I hired my first six months in the business? The number was zero. I was way off. I was way off. I had my office, I was way off. Because it came to realization. I said, I'm 20 years old. People have choices. They would rather choose to work for the broker that's been in the business for 20 years. They'd rather work for the broker that had a bigger name. Even though the name I started with was a pretty good name. I, it was all state homes. You know, I mean, it sounded pretty big, right? It sounded like the insurance company, but I separated the work all in state. So they didn't want, I didn't want to get in trouble with that. I wanted a letter, a, a name that started with the letter A because back then, you know, there was phone books and, you know, I wanted to have letter A, so I show up earlier in the phone book, right? And, and, and so, and so the funny thing about it was, is that I thought I had a good name, but the name wasn't enough. You know, I, 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 I thought that, you know, I was very helpful, but helpful was not enough. I wasn't a big company. I wasn't a Cobalt Banker. I wasn't a Century 21. Uh, you know, there was no Keller Williams at the time. And, and so I, I, I wasn't a Remax. And I wasn't a broker that had 20 years experience. I wasn't any of that. So in my first six months, I didn't recruit anyone. So guess where I got my first group of agents? I've always in my life had to go out of the box. Because I was born with more challenges than the normal everyday person. And when I started my company at 20, not only did I multiply the challenges I had, I still was born with the same challenges. But then I had more challenges. The challenge was I was young. The challenge was that, you know, uh, I was a new company. I had all types of challenges. But guess what? You overcome those challenges. So one of the things that you want to maybe take note on is when you have a goal 
after a month or two, if the goal doesn't work, you don't have to change the goal, just change what you're doing to get to that goal. See, true story is I didn't hire anyone in my first six months that I had my company. I was still paying for rent. I was still, you know, going out there, but you know what change I made? The change I made is what we incorporated at PWM. One of the changes that I made was that I called a, a, a school in San Jose by the name of Chamberlain Real Estate School. I talked to the owner of the school and I still am friends with Mark Chamberlain till this day. He still remembers me to this day. And, and I asked him, I said, you know, I, I started my company. You know, I'm having a hard time recruiting agents because I'm sort of new. I want to start my own real estate principles course. I want to start my own real estate principles course. I want to help people that are in the underserved communities. See, at that time in Sacramento, there were a lot of agents in town, but there weren't a lot of Vietnamese agents in town. There were a lot of agents in town, but there weren't that many Hispanic agents in town, nor there were that many Russian agents in town or Indian agents in town. You know, there, there, what, there was a lot of communities that were sort of underserved. What year was this? It was in 1995, okay? And, and, so, and so guess what happened? I started the class. Or nine, nine, five, nine, six, something like that. Uh, I started the class, and the class was called Principal. I advertised my class in places that that I was targeting the people that I wanted to take my class. So I started advertising the class in the real estate book. Back then, they used to be the magazine called the Real Estate Book, and the, and they had another book that was competitor competitor to the Real Estate book, book called the Real Estate Buyer's Guide. Okay. And so I advertised my class in the real estate book and the real estate buyer's guide. Those are the books that you get at the Safeways for free. You know what I'm saying? They, they put them all at the Safeways and Radies for free and advertising those books. And I started getting a, a ton of response. And people started taking my class. And I started helping people get their license and they'd come work for a company. So even though my first six months was zero people, my next six months, I accomplished the 12. The next six months, I accomplished the 12. But you know what? Did I make my $10,000 a month immediately? No. No, because new agents have to learn the business. It takes time for them to marinate in the business. It takes time for their families and their friends to know that they're in the business. Okay. Yeah, some people get lucky. They already have a warm market and a sphere. And so sometimes people will run into a deal right away. But it's not consistent until we give time for them to marinate. But I saw the vision. See, you'll start seeing the vision. Because what happens is, is those first 12 agents, maybe two or three of them do something. And the other nine, they take time. And then other two or three that do something, one starts rolling. One starts rolling. See, in our business, one of the things that you have to understand when you're building a team and is that 90% is that of the money is made by the top 10% of the people. Okay. It's not unlike professional sports because we're in a professional industry. It's not unlike a professional sport where LeBron James by himself makes 30% of the total salary paid out to the whole entire team or 40% of the total salary. It's not unlike a professional sport when you take the top three players of any NBA team and those top three players probably account for over 85 to 90% of the team's total payout, okay? You gotta understand that this is like a professional sport, okay? And you gotta understand that if you get 12 people, maybe one can make it to a professional level, two or three will be successful, the rest is gonna be a little bit tough. But what happens is, is this, is that after my first year, after my first year, 
what you're trying to accumulate is I want three people that was making me at least a thousand dollars a month. Okay, at least by year two. I have a significant jump in year two because I found a formula that worked. My classes worked. By year two, not only did my classes work and more and more people got licensed, but here's what happens. When you start recruiting and people that join know that they're not the only ones. See, when people come and ask you, how many agents do you have in your company? I say zero. They don't want to be agent number one. But in year two, when they say, how many agents do you have? And I say, I have 12 agents. Then they say, okay, I'll be number 13. I'm okay with that. By year two, I had 60 agents. And even if it's a 90-10 rule, six to 10 of them were producing at least $1,000 a month for me. And that was in year two or end of year two. We continued to grow like that. And the crazy thing about it was during this whole entire time, I was the only person building for my team. I was the only person. Everyone else just wore the agent's hat, the producing hat. I'm the only one in the company. I was the only one teaching my class. But guess what? We went from 12 agents to 60 agents the next year, eventually went over 100, okay? And, and, and one of the things that I learned that's one of the most powerful things And one of the most powerful things I learned about being an owner is that ownership income is very, very powerful income. Ownership income, and we're going to talk about that a little bit. Ownership income is very powerful income. The reason why it's very powerful income is because people search their whole lives to make this type of income. All right, people will work their whole lives to make this type of income. People will spend, and, and I know that it's like a broken record, but sometimes it's good in this environment to talk about it because, because then you're not so afraid to give up good for great. See, I was already on a good track. I graduated number two of my class in high school. I could have gone to almost any college, but I wanted to stay close to home, so I went to Davis. I was already getting very good grades at, at, at Davis, and I was very good in school in general, okay? So I was already on a good track in my life. I was already producing at a high level in real estate. See, a lot of us, we can be great producers, all right? But the income of ownership is very powerful when I realize something, and I, and I, I tell people, you got to realize something, okay? And the moment you realize this, you'll realize how powerful an ownership of type income, a, a residual type income is. And, and, and real estate is the best way for me to look at it that way, okay? It's the best way for me to look at it that way. Because I'm in real estate. I've had clients that would buy rental homes for cash. And a lot of my clients were actually doctor clients at the time, okay? And my doctor clients who, who've been doctors, I mean, they're retiring doctors, they're old. And, and they've been doctors for many years. They've, they've saved up this nest egg and they wanted to retire for being a doctor. So you know what they did? They started using the money they had to buy real estate, okay? And you know what they were looking for when they bought real estate? They were looking for cash flow. They were looking for cash flow, you know? Like in any cash flow game, they're looking for cash flow. When you look for cash flow, think about this way, because when you when you look for cash flow, you can look for cash flow in stocks. Very powerful to understand. You can look for cash flow 
in real estate. Okay, real estate. You can look for cash flow, all right, in a business. Okay, you can look for cash flow from a bank or from a CD or some type of treasury bond. When you look for cash flow in real estate, a $500,000 investment these days will get you maybe a $2,000 return. What I mean by that is you buy a half million dollar home you're renting that home out for $2,500 to $3,000 a month, but you're responsible for repair. You're responsible for taxes. You're re sometimes responsible for utilities. You're definitely responsible for vacancy, okay? <laughs> and so if you're lucky, your $500,000 investment will get you $24,000 a year, a million dollar investment, Okay, two world of rentals will get you $48,000 a year. Okay, one million to make 48,000 is a 4.8% return ROI on investment. It's a 4.8% return. Okay, that is a higher return than what you get from the bank. It's a higher return than you when you get from a CD. Okay. Okay, not only do you get that return, but you get one thing called appreciation if you buy at the right time. Okay, you get appreciation. If you go into stocks, you might get a higher return. You might get, if you go with a stock that's a little bit less than blue chip, if you go to a stock that's a little bit more aggressive, they'll ask you at the, you know, Charles Schwab, you want to go aggressive. If you go aggressive, then maybe you go into a stock or a mutual fund that goes into the 7% range. So then you say, well, why don't I invest in stock instead of real estate? Because stock, you go up in stock, you go down in stock, but stock is not something you own in your hands, so you don't get appreciation for it. Does it make sense? So the trade-off is stock, you might get 70% return on it. You might get a stock that jumps, and you might get more than 7% return on it. Historically, you're not going to get really much more than that, but you do not get appreciation. Does it make sense? So then you say, well, I don't want to deal with just residential real estate. I want to deal with commercial real estate. You know what commercial real estate these days? I'm a commercial real estate broker as well. In commercial real estate, my investors always talk about what we call a cap rate, capitalization rate. You know what the offer cap rate for a anchor type tenant or an A-class tenant which is like maybe you're buying a pad with a McDonald's on it or a Starbucks or something like that, your cap rate is looking at around 4% is less than this, okay? But it's more stable because, you know, you don't have normal everyday tenants signing one-year agreements. You have five-year leases. So yeah, you're going to get less than, less than a, a residential cap rate. Matter of fact, the appreciation probably going to be a little bit less it's going to be less volatile though, all right? Or you might be looking for a higher cap rate, but the tenants aren't going to be as good. You might get into the sixes, but the tenants aren't going to be as good, okay? And chances are the appreciation for those areas are going to be quite low because it's not residential. So, so then you say, well, real estate, we're looking about this, okay? Stock, we're looking a little bit more than this. I don't get appreciation. Banks and CDs, it's a guarantee. You don't deal with headaches. You don't deal with tenants. You don't deal with, you know, vacancy. But then you deal with a lot less than this. And if you own a business, then 95% of businesses fail. So you, you're dealing with a really risky investment if you could invest in some type of business. All right? But then your chances of success, if you do succeed, then you might get a bigger payoff than that 4.8%. So when I look at other investments, I see, I saw my clients dumping millions of dollars of their hard earned money that they took 20, 30 years to build this nest egg to build. And this is what they were looking for. They were okay putting 1 million of their dollars so that they could get four or $5,000 a month in return. 
me, I ask myself something, which is very powerful because it's very powerful to be able to look at this and to do this plan. The reason I'm showing you this is because a lot of what I do is calculating, okay? I said to myself, if I was a realtor, okay, or a loan officer, and I were to save $1,000 per deal, that means that a lot of us, when we close deals, we don't really save a lot of the money from our deal. We make the money and then we spend the money. But when you look at your bank account, you have to ask yourself, it's not about the money that you make that determines when you can retire. It's the amount of money that you save that determines when you can retire. Does it make sense? All right. Understand that it's not about the money that you make. It's about the money that you save. If you're able to save $1,000 per deal, it would take you one thousand deals okay to save one million dollars all right if you are not a superstar like doug or pitt or some of our superstars you are a regular loan officer closing two deals a month okay i'm going to take out my calculator Okay, because you need to be able to see this. I'm going to take out my calculator. I'm going to take a thousand divided by 24. Okay, because 24 deals, how many deals you close in a year? If you were able to save $1,000 per deal and you on average close two deals a month, it would take you 41 years to save a million dollars. How many of us can wait 41 years to save a million dollars so that you get to the point that the moment that you've saved this $1 million, the $1 million is worth around $4,000 a month. Isn't that the American dream for a lot of people that, that, you start working at around 22 and 23 years old after you graduate from college. Isn't that the plan for everyone? Because this is a funny number here, but it works out. Isn't that the plan? And isn't that what we're taught? It, aren't we taught to go to school for 18 until we're 18, 12 years of our life from one to 12? Aren't we taught to go to school eight in the morning to 3 p.m. every day for those 12 years of kindergarten and grade school till we get the a graduate from high school is never taught that to be do very well in school so we go to the best college and we go to school for four years to earn some type of bachelor's degree okay so that we could do what so by the time we're 22 and 23 years old okay that we could go work for someone and that you can work until you're 65 isn't that around 40 years away so that you can retire at 65 years old <laughs> So when you retire, you retire, and then you can enjoy the rest of your life, okay? That's the plan that we're taught. That's the plan that we teach our kids. That's the plan that we put all of our people into a system. And in that system, a lot of people right now, their pensions, if they work for a company or work for 41 years, this is not too far from what the average family gets when they retire. This is not far off, this number, these magic numbers. How many people do we know that when they retire, they have a million dollars in their 401k saved up, okay? A million dollars seems to be like some kind of magic number that people try to attain to retire. But that million dollars is worth around $4,000 a month. Okay, and so I asked myself, are you willing to be the producer? Are you willing to wait to save $1,000 per deal? I don't care how, how, how many deals it's gonna take you to save $1 million, but the average person is gonna take you 41 years to do it, okay? 
so that when you finally attain the one million dollars of savings and you say to yourself i'm going to go ahead that's my freedom date that that freedom date will afford you around four to five thousand dollars a month okay that's the cash flow that you be able you created for yourself me i failed I failed at my goal when I first started my company at age 20. At age 20 or 21, when I started my company, my goal was 10 agents times $1,000 equals $10,000. And I wanted to do it in, well, actually I wanted to do it in 10 years, but, but in my first year, I only managed to get around two to three agents. And I only managed to get around two to $3,000 a month. But not too long after that one year, maybe in like 15 months, this is 12 agents and two or three of them were making that for me. But by the 15 month area, I had around 25 agents of which around six or six to eight were making me at least a thousand dollars a month and i was making at least six to eight thousand dollars a month on those agents i made my four thousand dollars of residual income within less than two years to be safe within less than two years i was able to accomplish something that takes most people over 40 years of their lives to do. And, 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 and some people never achieve it. And some people never achieve it. The thing is, is that it is wonderful to be able to wear the producer hat. And it's wonderful to be able to make the money on every loan that you close it's an, it's it's wonderful but the thing is is that wonderful doesn't give your family income if you cannot work anymore okay wonderful does not allow you to stop working and retire that's why so many people for their whole lives they chase a cash flow because why? Because they want to be able to make money without lifting a finger, okay? At PWM, one of the most powerful things that we give people the ability to do, you don't have to do it. No one begging you to do it. No one begged me when I was 20 years old. No one even pushed me. No one even nudged me when I was 20 years old to, to chase a company. I sort of the math sort of made sense for me and I took the plunge and I did it, okay? But what I wanted to show you guys today is something even more powerful than that. I did all of that on my own. I did all of that on my own. At our company, we don't need to do it on our own. See, this is me. And these are all the people that I had to recruit. There was never a second level. So it just so happened that for me, I was lucky because I was talented at recruiting. And I stuck to my guns and I continued to recruit. It's a lucky skill that I had. And I think in a way I might have been born with it. What PWM does that's that's different than lucky is that if this is you, we don't allow you just to go one level and build a team for yourself. We let you go two, three, four, five, six, seven levels. Because within those seven levels, you just need to find someone
that has that skill set and show them what we're capable of doing. Because then the need to do this for me, see right now, me at Berkshire, I have over 400 agents, but of my 400 agents, around 360 of them are sort of direct line to me. We don't have any kind of team building, really, really anything, you know, part of our normal brokerage models, normal brokerage model. So this is me and Amanda, 300 people right there. But that doesn't have to be the case. The PWM, really, this is all you need. You don't need too much more than this. Because these five good builders, they'll become 25 this way. These 25 can become 125 this way. These 125, that's only if you have five people that you run into in your first 10 years in this business that, that, that have the same type of skill set that I was lucky enough to be born with, okay? And, and even if it took years for those five people to become 25, five each, and it took years for those five to become 125. See, we allow you to grow exponentially. See, because the math is still the same. You gotta understand, when I have clients that buy residential property, the math is the same. It's rental units. You buy a house, it's one unit, and you get more rent from that one rental unit. I have clients that bought duplexes and they get two halfplexes for one duplex. So they get two rental units, but each of the rental units get a little bit less rent. I have clients that buy fourplexes and they get less rent, but there's four. I have clients that bought apartment complexes. Of course, those cost millions and the rent for complex, apartment complexes are less per unit. So, so what if you make $1,000 a month and you have 10 of them, or you make $300 a month from a loan officer, but you have 35 of them, okay? The numbers still work out, but the beauty that I did not have when I was my own broker at Allstate Homes, or when we became elite and cool banker, and when we became Berkshire Hathaway, okay? I never had the power of a comp plan like this. I never had a, the power of duplication like this. I was never able to give any of my people this type of comp plan and this type of power, okay? Because I want to show everyone something. I've been approached by every company on the planet that, that was within calling distance of them. They never left my company. They never left when I was my, my own single person. They never left. They never left when I was all stayed home. They were with me when I was all stayed home. They never left when I became Cobalt Banker and I started charging them almost 8% franchise fees, even though they didn't need it the most. You know, because they're already a good producing team. They never needed it, the name. They did not leave when I left Cobalt Banker. They did not leave when I joined Berkshire Hathaway. They were with me. These are people that came to all my parties. These are people that attended my wedding. These are people that saw my kids grow up. Okay? They never left. They never left. Until three years ago, they left. Until three years ago, they left. And I said to myself, what in the world, after being with me for over 20 years, 
would give a group like this a reason to leave. You know, it wasn't because of money. The reason I, it wasn't because of what I was paying them because my split with them was close to 100%. It wasn't because I charged them any fees because I have no office and fees. okay? It wasn't because, you know, they didn't have a space to work. I had a nice office, I gave them the whole room, everything. It wasn't because of any of that. Three years ago, and tell me when you're ready, okay? Yeah, we're trying. Yeah, three years ago, they left to a company called EXP. They did not leave for Keller Williams, but they did leave for EXP, okay? You know what they left for? They left for the ability to be able to grow their team and for their team to grow exponentially. You know, I'm gonna be perfectly honest with you. One of the biggest builders from EXP, Brent Gov, had been someone I would have, have known for almost 30 years. When I first became Cobalt Banker, I think in 2001, I, I reached out to Brent and when he was Remax Gold. He loved, he was, he was all gold at that time. I could not touch him. So when he moved to Keller Williams, I was actually sort of surprised that man, Brent left to Keller Williams, you know? But that's because he was, he loved team building. And Brent was super successful team builder at Keller Williams. But it's just the model there didn't, he never made a lot, a lot. And over the years, I've had Brent do a presentation for us right in this room. You know, he wrote his book, Momentum. I like this. I had him go talk about it in front of my agents. You know, so I've always had a huge, uh, you know, uh, you know, admiration for him. Okay. And when I became Berkshire Hathaway, he was, he was first on my list of who I should call to see if he wanted to get a Berkshire Hathaway office for me in Roseville, actually. But before I had a chance to do that, he joined a company called EXP. And I thought to myself, I never thought Brent would have left Keller. I never thought he would have left. But he did. And I, and I thought at the time, I was thinking to myself, man, I, I, uh, EXP, is a very little late in the game, actually. Because, because you know, I mean, I've, I've seen him around for like five, six years. I haven't seen a lot of growth. I haven't seen like a ton of growth. Okay, I haven't seen a ton of growth. You know, and all of a sudden, you know, Brent's not part of it. So I said to myself in my head, I'll give it six months. When it doesn't work, I'll reach back to Brent. Let's see if uh, let's see if he wants to open up an office for Berkshire Hathaway. I, I said it for myself. I even spoke to Brent about it. Okay, he was at my home at the time, and and things were a little bit rough, rocky a little bit. He was at my home, and and and, and we were talking a little bit, and 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 so all of a sudden, pull up the EXP model, the the fur, the, the yeah. Okay, no, not that one, the, the previous one, the other one. Pull up the one that uh, were, were there only in the first five years. You can do that one, it's fine. Okay, let's pull it up. You guys won't be able to see it. Okay, you won't be able to see it too much. All right, but, but in 2009, they started with 25 people. By 2001, they had like 100. By 2002, they had like two, 300. Matter of fact, by year six, 2009, six years later, they had 864 people. In, in five years, they're at like that 500 person mark, okay? All right, go back to the one where they had, the, uh, go back to the slide I told you that, that they had the projection, this one right here. Again, they put milestones, see, they put milestones. And, 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 and around here in year five, okay, they had around seven, 800 people, year six, I mean, seven, 800 people, and they were projecting that this is where they're gonna be. See, Brent joined at about right here. He joined about 2016, 2017. That's where he sort of joined. He didn't join here. He didn't join here. You join here, 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 or here. You join somewhere over here. Okay. They had their ups and their downs, probably about two or three years. And then they think, man, what the hell are we doing? We 
spend two or three years in it. We only have a hundred people. We should quit. None of our people are producing. We're not making any money. Okay. Maybe this is a bad idea. Should have stayed at Keller. Okay. But they stayed the course. They stayed the course. All right. Took them five years to find guys like Brent Gubb. Took them six, seven years to convince other people, companies at a time, to switch over to their model. Okay. But, but in March 2021, pulled out that screenshot. I keep on getting these things. Okay. Pull out that screenshot that they announced 50,000. EXP exceeds 50,000, March 2021. Okay. In, in this is the end of 2021. I think that number is more than 70,000 right now. How many people must have laughed at that company when they first started in 2009? How many people must have turned out not that company in their first five years? Okay. How many people called this some kind of Ponzi scheme, some kind of pyramid scheme? How many people made fun of something like this? Even though Keller Williams has been around for so long, how many people said it wouldn't work? Everybody, everybody, okay? Who is laughing now? Who is laughing now? Who is laughing when the owner of this company has a B? In front of his name, billionaire, not millionaire. Who is laughing at Brent when he left Keller Williams and now he has 24,000 people on his team? Who's laughing at that? Okay, who's laughing at that? Our model is powerful. Our model, proven, okay? Prove it, right? A model like this takes untouchable groups of people from companies that you would never think any company could touch. Because you know why? Because I was losing my untouchable people that I called family. I was losing untouchable people, okay? So when I saw how powerful a model like this was, I said to myself, I'm not going to do this in real estate. I'm going to do this in something I believe is much more powerful than real estate, which is mortgage. As a business plan, okay, we're here huddling here, guys. As a business plan, do you know why I feel that this is more powerful? Because real estate is not necessarily made for a cloud. In real estate, our people are boots on the ground. In real estate, we need to meet with customers. Not always, we can meet them at Starbucks, okay? But they managed to turn a boots on the ground industry into a cloud. Mortgage was made for cloud, okay? How do I know? Because the number one mortgage lender in the country, United States of America, is called Quicken. And everything they do is in a cloud, okay? So guess what? We're not doing something that's not out there already being done. Something that's even more powerful than that. Something that's even more powerful than that is that we are a broker. We are not limited to one set of criteria. We're not limited to working only as far as we're willing to drive. In real estate, we're limited to how far we're willing to go. In mortgage, we could go where our internet goes, okay? When our internet goes to the moon, we will be doing loans for people who are gonna be getting property on the moon, okay? Or on Mars because we are only limited by the internet, okay? What's more powerful? Our power is in our comp plan, and by next year, our comp plan is even gonna be more powerful. 
That is a sneak preview of what's going to happen next year. Okay. Our comp plan is going to be even more powerful. And so, so when you look at the first 2009 to December 2015, that's, that's, that's five, six years, we got to 800 people. Now you tell me of those 800 people are all 800 top producers? No. Maybe 80 people are good producers. 10% rule. But now of their over 50,000 people, you think all 50,000 people are top producers? No. But 5,000 top producers, nothing to laugh at. Okay. So the plan for us is that bring up our plan, John. The plan for us is that we do bring, okay, seven levels. That, that, that one person can recruit five people. That the five can become 10, the 10 can become 25, 125, 625 people because when your team starts to duplicate, so show me the duplication one. See, look, I don't need you to try to get these numbers right here, okay? These numbers is just math, okay? If you looked at these numbers that's on our screen, if you have 40 loan officers, and the reason I put the word 40 is you got to get the 40 loan officers to be able to go seven levels deep yeah, on your front line. That's the reason I put 40. Hey, I had over 60 in two years. It doesn't matter if it takes you seven years to get to 40. Our company hopefully will be here for the next 100 years, okay? And so you all have five or 10 years. But if your 40 loan officers only on average close one meal a month, and it takes them two or three years to get to that point, and all they do is they're not even a times five, they're only a times two, that your 40 people in line two become 80, in line three become 160, 320, 640, 1280, you're gonna have some teams that go, you're gonna have some people that recruit 10, 20, 30 people. And then you're gonna have people that some people that recruit one. But if you go, with every person on average close one deal, okay? One deal you're only making $300 from, not even a thousand. But if every person on average close one deal, front line pays you 14,000 a month, 160,000 a year, you made your goal of trying to get four or $5,000 a month only on line number one. If you get to line number two, that's another 30,000, that's $500,000 a year, you can stop there. But the thing is, what if your team, Brent, I don't know, would have even believed it if we told him that after four or five years at EXP, he'd have 24,000 people on his team. Sometimes in these type of businesses, we grow well beyond our wildest imagination because we let exponential growth take place. But even if, but even if, it, and so I showed this model to my sons and these numbers don't make sense to him because he don't really understand the value of money for those people in this world where they've never made more than $25 an hour for those people in this world that has never seen a check higher than $10,000 in a month. They don't believe in numbers like this. Bill Hill. You ask LeBron James and Michael Jordan, yeah. who's a billionaire right now, when he was homeless, do you think he would have believed that one day he was a billionaire making hundreds of million dollars a year? No. People that grow up or people that are not used to making even $10,000 a month, they don't believe in numbers like this. But when Oprah Winfrey can make $250 million a year just being on TV on a one, one hour a day show, then you know money like that exists. You know that there are people out there that are worth hundreds of billions of dollars. Money like that exists, but we have to put ourselves in a vehicle that allows us to be able to capture something like that. 
this vehicle, even if the number is 40, it goes to 80, 160, that you get to the point where you have 2,500 people on your seventh level, even if you're only making one deal a month on that seventh level, the numbers look like $21 million a year. And you think to yourself, that's an impossible number to achieve. Yes, I have to agree. It's impossible for 99% of the people out there. But for that 1%, and that 1% might be you. If that 1%, I know that Brent is that one of those 1%ers that have 24,000, not 2,400, 24,000 people on his team. He's already making about this amount every single year, right now as we speak. Is that right? Yes, sir. Okay. Then even if you didn't get there, how many people would be happy if you only got to keep $500,000 a year, okay? $500,000 a year, residual income, you stop what you're doing and you enjoy the rest of your life, $500,000 a year. Is that good enough for you as a minimum? Is that good enough for a lot of people? The answer is you can work for the state, you can work for government, you can work for whoever you want, you can work for yourself, you can work in a job. I do not know what industry you need to work for that when you retire, you're gonna get $500,000 a year. I don't know what industry that is, but I know that that is a possibility at our company. I know that it's a possibility at our company. I will bet that People like Doug and Pitt, that's the possibility easily two or three years from now. Easy. That's their minimum. Okay? Not maximum, minimum. All right? The thing is that this type of income is what gets people to leave and, and buy into something like this. So, so we at our company, yeah, today we're going to talk about how to get our people to produce more. See me, I'm 30 years in the business. Trust me, I've seen plenty of people do not make a lot of money in year one and year two, and all of a sudden in year three, they brought them. Okay? The great Pitt Miller made around $40,000 the first year. Great Mr. Doug Ross made around 60, 70,000 hours the first year. You know, that's great. See, people do need time to blossom. But during the time that people are blossoming, by year three, four, or five in our company, you were going to get people that have already blossomed. See, by year two, three, four, and five in our company, we're going to get people that have already blossomed. See, bring up that EXP model. Okay. Yeah. See, right now, guys, you know where you are? You're not here when we're at 50,000 people. You're not here when they're 40,000 here, when they're 30 here, when they're at 25 or 20 or 16. You're not even here when they're at 864 people because between here and here, okay, this is a six year, five year. You know where you are? You're right here. About when they had around 25 to 100 people. In that map, you are sitting in this opportunity way back here that's where you're sitting right now you're sitting when we're still feeling things out we're releasing our software that calculates everything this coming month okay we decided on january 1st to release all this stuff we're releasing our training platform that we just signed this coming month we're releasing so many things that will make us ready to re for us to release a comp plan that's going to put this whole industry upside down Okay, and so and so, where are you in the timeline of things? You are at the very beginning. Are you brave enough to give yourself two or three years in this? So when we bring in the big hitters in bunches, those big big hitters all land somewhere beneath you. You understand that? You see, 
the only major lesson that I wanted to show you today is that this is where we're at. This is our comp plan. Okay, where I started from is I was lucky enough to make that decision, all right, that ownership was meant for me. I was lucky enough to make that decision. And, and now for us, be good, be incredible at being a wonderful loan officer, but give yourself a chance to retire at it. Give yourself a chance to retire at it, okay? And then the question is how? Figure out how. I had to become a real estate instructor to figure out how to do it. But the funny thing about it is, is figuring how to build your team full of great loan officers is not that hard to do if you give it some attention. Some of us grew our team by putting an ad online. Some of us grow our team by launching our people. When I first started this company, when I had more time, I would spend time launching my people. I would spend time having little get togethers, okay, for my people and I launched them, okay? Your recruits aren't recruits until they get their first set of recruits. Your recruits aren't, aren't real builders until they get the taste of their first bonus check, okay? When they have real loan officers closing real deals, but you will all see that when the deal closes, you make real money, okay? Give yourself an opportunity to taste those bonus checks. And then one day when you taste huge bonus checks, you know, it's, it, it's gonna change your world forever. Okay, it's gonna change your world forever. All right, so that's the message I wanted to get across. But the last message that I, I wanted to get across, so you can turn that off, John. This is my last message for the day. I'm gonna turn it back over, okay? The last message I wanted to get across is this, okay? Is, is, is a message that I gave to both of my sons. And it wasn't a very complicated message, okay? The message I wanted to get across was that when dad started his company, he was only looking for 10 agents to make $1,000 from each agent and to make $10,000 a month because of the power of what we're doing, I just want you to change your formula a little bit, sons. I want you to take five years of your life. I want you to take five years of your life. I want you to find 10 agents or MLOs each year so that in five years you have 50 good people. I understand that some of the people are gonna come, some of the people are gonna go. I, some, I understand that some of the people are gonna produce and some of the people are not. I understand that you get 10 good people for the year, you might have to get by 50 people to get 10 good ones. Okay, I understand all of that. But in five years, if you find 50 good people, and if you can make on average $1,000 from a good person, that's $50,000 a month, that's $600,000 a year, that is more than any salary job I can think of, whether it be in the legal field, the medical field, whatever field. So you can decide, sons, you can decide. You can decide to go to a four-year college 
You can decide to become an engineer. You decide to do whatever you want. But I wanted to start you off when you're 18 years old with a plan. Okay? Plan is let's try to find 10 people. And those 10 people just need to fall from levels one through seven. You don't have to be front line. They just have to fall somewhere in there. You have 50 good people somewhere in there. And you can make $1,000 a month on average from those 50 good people. That's $600,000 a year. That's $50,000 a month. $600,000 a year. Okay. And that's, and that's incredible. Okay? And that's incredible for you. Okay. And that's incredible for you. See, one of the things that all of us, we have, is we have an opportunity to give anyone that we meet an opportunity to get into a plan like this. Because one of the things that people don't have enough in the world are plans. They don't have direction. And I wanted to make sure that my kids had direction. I wanted to make sure that every loan officer in our company, we have direction. When Doug and I would put this together, we'd put this together not to make money for us as much as show everyone out there how to become a wonderful loan officer to make money from them. And Doug and Pitt are great people pouring their hearts out to train people on how to become great loan officers. And we as a company, we're giving you, we're pouring our hearts out to train you how to become great owners and builders as well. Okay, we have the opportunity. We are literally only in year two and a half of our company. You know, who is gonna be standing side by side with us at year 10? Who is gonna be there in our company that's gonna have 24,000 people on his team in year 10? Okay, I hope it's gonna be one of you. All right, all right, hey, thanks everyone. That's my time. Okay. Hopefully you're excited, okay? Please help me welcome back up Doug and Pitt and then uh, and Luke. All right, we're gonna bring Doug Ross up and Doug is gonna talk about building his loan officer business in the next 30 minutes. <laughs> I'll go quick. <laughs> or Man, less. Tough act to follow, Mr. Robert. Thank you. I just every time Robert speaks, I get inspired. I'll leave my name up there. Uh, to want to keep growing my team, grow those residuals. You know, I didn't really understand how this would grow the way it would when we met together two and a half years ago. And it's incredible to see that everything Robert said would happen is happening. And it's neat because it was like a belief at first, but now it's turning into a reality. And it's really neat to see. And, you know, Robert said something really interesting. He said that 90% of the loans are closed by 10% of the loan officers. And that's not a new statistic. I heard that when I first got in this industry. And my goal was, I want to be the top 10%. I want to be the loan officer that's closing 90% of the transaction out there. I wanted to be in that category. And I had this CD, a couple CDs from this guy. I couldn't even afford to be a part of his program because I was so broke at the time. Um, and so I, I just ended up burning it from a friend who bought the program. And in this program, he laid out the strategy of how to get there, the strategy of how to make yourself into the top 10% producing category as a loan officer. And when I first started it, I'm like, okay, I believe it's going to work. He's doing it, right? I just, I have this faith that it's all going to work out. And then I used this very strategy to climb that ladder. And guys, I'm standing here today, not because I believe it's going to work. I'm telling you, it worked for me. Right? I did the systems. I did all the stuff that I'm going to encourage you guys to do. The stuff that we talk about in our voluntary accountability program, because it works. And it's not because I think it's going to work. It's because it's working and it has worked personally for me. It's changed my life financially and it's changed my family's lives financially. I'm a really analytical person. I like to simplify things down, right? And the, the system that I'm going to go over is a simple four day strategy. It's a prospecting strategy to make sure that you're constantly generating new business and creating this empire of people that you can now dip into to ask for business from, okay? It's really simple, it's simple, it's not easy, but it's a simple strategy. And so I don't know if we wanna use the projector again, I know we kind of turned it off, is that still a possibility? If not, I could just write it up on the board, it's, there's really not a lot of content to my slides here. But um, 
So, and again, guys, for those of you who, who attended the Voluntary Accountability Program, we've got two classes that have graduated, guys. And the way I know these strategies work is because the last class that came, and honestly, of our class, there were like maybe five or six people that actually showed up and did the work. And those five or six people added over 100 new business partners in just two months. Okay, combined, class, 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 right? Five or six people added about 100 total new business partners in two months by following this simple formula. Okay, so it works. I know it works because we do it class after class. And so I wanna break this down for you guys so you can have some idea of what you should be shooting for on a weekly basis to make sure that you're earning your way into that top 10% earning bracket as a loan officer. Because again, I love that stat. 90% of the loans are done by 10% of the loan officers. So day one is a simple strategy. Day one's the hardest day. If you can get through day one, all the rest of the days are easy. Now day one could be on a Monday. Day one could be on a Tuesday. I don't care what day it falls on. For me, it was a Monday because I like to do the hardest things first. I like to get over the hard stuff, get the heavy lifting done, and then cruise for the rest of the week. So on day one, I have two goals for you in 2022. Okay, so this is gonna be your Monday or your Tuesday or your Wednesday. I want you to try and set two to three appointments with new business partners for the week. Day one is you're setting up your week to get in front of two to three new business partners to network with, to add to your empire of realtors that said, sure, I'll send you a deal. And I don't care how you do it, right? At first I'm like, you got a cold call, you gotta do this. But man, if I've learned anything from the voluntary accountability program is there's a lot of ways to get these two to three appointments. But as long as you're hitting that as your average, then you're on your way to getting 100 business partners by the end of the year. So two to three appointments, whether you're cold calling, which I'll, I'll role play with Pitt here in a minute just to kind of give you guys some, some scripting for that, whether it's stopping in at 10 new open houses on a weekend, giving your card, networking a little bit, trying to set an appointment, whether it's just going to LinkedIn to try and find your realtors, whatever strategy you employ, it doesn't matter. The result I want is just to get two to three appointments with new business partners. So I'm gonna share my strategy. I'm gonna share uh, how I was taught to get these two to three appointments. My big thing was cold calling. It was easy to do. I could knock it in in an hour, right? I make my 30 calls, I line them up. And what I would do is I, was, I would research listings in my neighborhood. UWM actually makes this real easy, right? This is before they were doing that. I would go on Metro List Pro and I'd pull up all of the listings in my neighborhood or in Elk Grove at the time. And then I'd, I'd, I'd hone in on the listings that were near me that I could say were in my neighborhood. Now, my neighborhood was the city of Elk Grove, right? I mean, you, I could justify that anyway, right? But it was fun when they were actually in my neighborhood because they knew a little more about it. But this is how I would find my 30 people. And I would cold call 30 agents every day one. And of those 30 agents, I would get between two to three appointments. Okay, which means what guys, which means when you prospect, when you're in sales, you have to get used to losing more than you win. You are going to lose more than you win. I found my hundred people, but I had to talk to a thousand to find them. It's like dating, right? You gotta put yourself out there constantly to find your people. So a good closing percentage is 10%. If you can book an appointment with 10% of the calls you're making, you're right at my level. I never breached more than 10%. Now there are, there are guys in our voluntary accountability program, they actually have better numbers than me. They can get, and there's one person that booked, I think seven appointments from 30 calls. Doubled my numbers, it was incredible. They got a script that's working for them. I'm like, dude, just keep doing it. I'm not even gonna touch that, right? You got something that's golden, right? But 10% is about what you can expect. So how do you approach these calls? Just to kind of hear you guys, I want you guys to hear me do it live. So I'm gonna call, I'm gonna cold call Pitt if that's cool. So Pitt's a realtor, right? He's got a listing in my neighborhood. It's Monday morning, I'm getting jazzed up. And by the way, before I pick up this call and I do these 30 calls real quick, I set him up ahead of time. I know exactly what his listing is, where it was, what company he works for. I even had their stats my first year, how many listings he closed. I just didn't like that because I get intimidated. If I saw that they had 100 listings, I'd already be nervous, more nervous than the guy that closed 10. But anyways, I line them all up on Sunday night. I do my research, get my stuff done. So I literally just had to sit down, pick up the phone and knock out 30 calls. And it's, dude, 45 minutes, I was done. It was the hardest part of my week, but I got it done and I set up my week for success. So I'm calling up Mr. Pitt, ring, ring, ring. This is Pitt, how's it going? Pitt, what's going on, man? It's Doug over at Pacific Wholesale Mortgage. How you doing, my friend? 
You're a loan officer? I am a loan officer. Yeah, man. Happy Monday. Yeah. <laughs> what are you calling me about? Well, listen, first off, I super appreciate you taking my phone call. Um, do you have a quick two minutes to chat? I promise it won't be longer than that. All right, I'll give you two minutes. All right, so I, I came across your contact information because you have a listing in my neighborhood, actually. Uh, it's off of Willow Tree Way. How's that listing coming along? It's going really good. I, I got it at a great price. Yeah? It's going to sell fast. Any offers yet? Or I can't tell you that after a few years. <laughs> All right, so we got, we got some good stuff in the works. Well, listen, man, you're killing it out there. I'd love to meet you. I'd love to network with people in the industry, get to know how you're bringing in business, and maybe how I can help you close an extra couple transactions next year. I'd love to sit down with you for a quick 15 minute cup of coffee. I got some time tomorrow. What do you think? Well, I don't, I don't like to do that. I'm, I'm too busy for that. I totally get it, man. So you're just busy with listings, busy bringing it. What's, what's the busyness? Yeah, I'm going to a listing right now. Do you want to go along with me? Wow. Uh, sure. Let's do it. Right. Okay. That took a turn. That never happens. <laughs> Why don't you give me a different objection? <laughs> like something like I work with a lender. I'm not going <laughs> to. Like, sure. Yeah. Great. Yeah. We're going. <laughs> okay. That one's booked. That's not really going to happen. I work with Luke Vaughn. Oh, Lucas Vaughn. I've heard of that guy, man. He's, he's, he seems incredible, right? I'm, I'm sure. And I, I know that great realtors work with great loan officers. And I'll tell you what, I want you to keep sending them all your business. The purpose behind us getting together is I want to help you close an extra five or six transactions you wouldn't have got if you weren't working with me. And that stuff that I earned with you for you, that's the stuff we can close together. Just a quick 15 minutes. That's a free cup of coffee. In fact, I'll bring it to your office. How does tomorrow at 11 sound? Sounds great. All right, so what you're doing, guys, is you're practicing objections. You will always hear from realtors, I got lenders, right? I got something neat going on here. I don't want to cheat on my wife, right? Because I feel like, man, I feel like I'm cheating on my wife with you if I'm in some disappointment, right? And I'm not looking to do that. I'm encouraging them. I'm disarming them by saying, dude, keep doing what you're doing. But I might bring something to the table that can help you close an extra two or three transactions. And that's a win-win because I'm getting business I wouldn't have got, and you're getting business you wouldn't have got. And that's the mindset I'm heading into these appointments with, right? And again, you will lose more than you win. You will hear more no's than you hear yeses. But I mean, professional, uh, professional baseball players, their batting average is like what? Three out of 10, two out of 10. And yet they're getting paid millions of dollars for those kinds of averages. So understand that when you play at a professional level, like Robert said, you got to plan on being okay with the no. Don't personalize it. And I used to have these army men on my, on my desk and every time someone said no, I just, I just flip one off, right? Because I was one closer to a yes. And I knew that of those 10, I'd get at least one. Okay? So that's how I do the call. That's just how Doug does it. We got scripts in the back office. If you join our voluntary accountability program, I'll walk you through it. Okay? But that's not the only way. There's not just one way to the top of the mountain. That's just a way that works for me. So you can change it and drop, drop it at open houses. Do the kind of stuff that Pitt's going to talk about. There's a lot of ways. But the goal is two to three appointments. Okay, that's what you got to be hitting every week. And if you do the math, that gives you 10 business partners a month. And if you keep that up for a year, that's 120 business partners in a year. Now that's an empire of people. At that point, you, got, you don't got to keep setting this many appointments. You're good. Your hands are full. And that brings us to the second part of day one. The second part of day one is you got to connect and value add with all of your existing realtors. Now, I should probably define a business partner, right? A business partner is somebody who gets in front of people all day long who have clients that need loans. Now, a realtor is going to be probably your most powerful business partner just because they get paid when you do. All the other industries, they're not. The same incentive isn't quite there. So I usually targeted the business partners, but there's a lot of different types of business or realtors. There's a lot of different types of business partners. There's financial advisors, there's CPAs, there's divorce attorneys, there's, um, I don't know, those are the ones I could think of, right? But there's a lot of people to target. And if you want to start out, go after some of the low hanging fruit, right? The financial advisors, those guys aren't getting harassed uh, by lenders as much as your realtors will, okay? But the idea is again, two to three new appointments with new business partners. The other thing I do on my Mondays is I connect with all of my existing realtors, okay, via a phone call, a text message. Every weekend, I'm thinking, what am I going to say this week? What's my value add going to be this week? Man, we got this new program. Oh, man, UWM just released. I can put 15% down on an investment property. Guys, this is huge. What do I do? I pick up the phone. And I call my 90 people. Have a great conversation. See how the weekend went. Listen, I got some news. It's big. I'm sharing enthusiasm. I'm sharing value. I'm helping them grow their businesses, right? So the first part is you're planting seeds, planting my seeds, got my, my appointments. But if you never come back to them, 
If you meet with their realtor and you never really sit down with them again or follow up with them, they're not going to call you. You have to take 100% responsibility for that relationship becoming something or not. 100%. During COVID, when things were crazy and I didn't have time to prospect, man, none of my realtors called me for like two months, right? I didn't take it personally because I knew that I was in charge of those relationships 100%. So you got to follow up. One amazing appointment usually isn't going to get you any leads. Usually it takes five to 12 contacts to build enough trust, to like you enough to be like, all right, I'll send you my first one. Okay. So you got to plan on this part. Every Monday or whatever day of the week, I'm touching base with you. We're going to talk about how I can help you grow. What are we doing this week? You got an open house? Let's go to a listing. Let's do it. I'm here for you. How can I help you grow? Okay. And if you do that, you follow up week after week. Ultimately, you're going to start getting those 50, 60 realtors that are going to start giving you business. You're going to start getting leads. So that's day one. And day one's the hardest. I always did my cold calls first before I called my existing realtors. So I get the hard thing done and then I feel great because I'd be connecting with all my people and laughing and having a good time. Okay. So I, I tried to get that done first. Day two. Day two is pipeline day. Pipeline day is when you're reaching out to all uh, everyone that's in contract. So these are all the people who are in contract. When you're new, you might only have a few. When you get bigger, it could be uh, take you a couple hours to get through. Now, what you're doing, the purpose behind day two pipeline contacts is you're contacting your listing agent your buyer's agents, and your borrowers. And there's two purposes behind the contact. Number one is to give a great, I call them awesome updates. I'm calling with your awesome update call, right? We got the CD went out yesterday, Mr. Borrower. I appreciate you signing it. Do you have any questions for me? Okay, great. Is there anything else I can do for you? All right, and then boom, second part, referral ask. Man, the best compliment you can give me and my team is not keeping us a secret, sending us a referral. If you could think of anybody that could benefit from our services, please don't keep me a secret. Sound like a deal? Yeah, sounds good. That's my, my, my soft ask. And then week two or three, I'm actually gonna say, who can you think of? What am I doing wrong? I haven't got a referral yet. I thought our team was great. What's going on, Mr. Borrower? What can I do? Who can you think of? I'll buy them lunch, let's go out together. I just wanna meet more people, help more families. That's the drumbeat. And so when they know when that call's coming on day two of the week, they know what you're asking for and you got to do it lovingly and light and make it feel great. And you always give before you ask. You always give them the update. Ask them if there's anything else they need. By the way, passing thought. Have you thought of anybody yet? I'm excited. I want to help more people. It's slow right now. Whatever. Whatever your reason is. Okay, so that's your borrower contact. This is every week. I usually tell them, expect your update call before 11 o'clock a.m. on a Tuesday. I usually try to knock them out before then. Okay. Now you're also calling your buyer's agents. Obviously, that's a simple one. You're already calling your buyer's agents every Monday, every day one. But the listing agent's a good one. I like the listing agent. This is a great opportunity to create a new relationship, and I don't think enough loan officers are taking advantage of it. So when you get a new contract, right? Whenever you get a new contract, Monday morning you come rolling in, you're like, oh my gosh, we got a contract. This is great. This is an opportunity for you to add to your business partner pool because you're about to work with somebody. And you get to flex your muscles and show them how great you are during the transaction. And if you set the stage right, you can ask permission for a relationship after. So usually when I get a new, when I, when I get a new purchase contract, I'll call a listing agent, all excited. Man, I'm so excited. Congratulations, we're in contract. And I'll review the contract with them. So it looks like we got a 21 day close. We got a quick 17 day loan contingency, right? Is this all sounding right to you? Yeah, 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 sounds great. Perfect, listen, this is how my team and I work. So we're gonna contact you every week with updates. So you will never be guessing as to where the file sits. I'm also really good on the phone. So if you ever need to get a hold of me, this is my cell phone number. But if we can give you updates every week and close this deal on time, can I earn a cup of coffee with you? Can I earn that cup of coffee if I deliver the way I'm promising? It's a soft setup, right? And there, no one has said no to that, by the way. I've never had a listing agent um, say no to that. They've ghosted me towards the end of the transaction because I knew it was coming, but they've never said no up front because I'm like, hey, if I give all this stuff, can I earn a cup of coffee with you? I'm sure, yeah, sounds good. Can you repeat that what you said about the listing agent? Say it one more time. The whole thing? Yeah, they're saying, yeah. So as soon as you get a contract, right, you're all excited and you're gonna look at who the listing agent is. A lot of times you've called them ahead of time. And you said, hey, these are great buyers, right? We're gonna do this, you're selling yourself. Once that contract comes and you call them up and you say, hey, I'm excited to work with you, Congratulations on getting this thing into contract. 
So just to confirm, it looks like we're looking at a 21 day close or a 30 day close. Sometimes I'll ask for the buyer selling a house or I'm sorry, is the seller selling a house to buy another one? Like what's that look like? And then I'll say, listen, this is how my team works. Okay, so we're gonna update you every week. It's gonna be on a Tuesday, it's gonna be before 11. Sometimes I'll ask, how would you prefer that update to be? You want me to have email a TC? I don't like asking that too much because then they'll pawn me off to their team and then I never get a, I never get a chance to get a hold of them again. So I usually say, I'll call you every Tuesday with an update. But if I if we can close this transaction on time, meet all the contract requirements, I keep you in the loop, call you every week. Can I earn a cup of coffee with, with you and all said and done? Can I earn that? Can you give me that? This is an easy one, guys. I don't have to cold call a listing agent. They come to me. They just pop up on your doorstep. All you got to do is make a couple calls, set it up right. And if you do a good job of a transaction, right, then you earn that cup of coffee and you can create a new relationship. Someone like me who's coasting. Not really, I wouldn't say coasting because I'm always, I'm always value adding to my existing database and it's so big I don't necessarily have to cold call any longer. But this is a huge piece for me. I'm always getting new contracts rolling in. It's a great source for me to get new business partners. All right, so that's day two. So the purpose behind your day two, and I do it on a Tuesday, as I'm, everyone's going to hear from me. And that's actually what I sell my buyer's agents on when they want to work with me. Listen, I'm really good at communication. I'm going to call the listing agent. I'm going to call you. I'm going to call the borrower every week to make sure everybody knows what's going on in that transaction. The biggest problem with being a realtor sometimes is you feel disempowered. You can't really control the transaction because the lender's pushing the stuff. And so the more control you allow them to feel they have, the more comfortable they're going to feel with working with you. Okay, so that's how you handle that one. Day two is important. And don't forget to ask for the referral. Of all the things I'm weakest, my team, it's not asking for the referral on a Tuesday update. Okay, so day three, kind of go quick. So day three is database day. This is another fun day, right? Pipeline, day three, day, they're all fun for me. Day one dealing with is kind of hard. So database day is where I'm trying to contact all my previous clients that have closed a deal. When you start to get bigger, it starts to get overwhelming. You don't keep up with it. But I usually contact them on the anniversary. So I'll print off all my old closed loans and when they did, and I'll pull up all my Decembers for the last six years, and I'll just work my way down the list. Every Wednesday, I'll call like 10 or 15 of them. How's it going? What are you guys doing for Christmas? Right? We're, this, is the, this is the anniversary of our clothes. I'm so excited. You still loving the place? Just have a conversation with them. Right? But these kind of calls keep you relevant to them. It helps them under, kind of feel like you see them as a person. You want a relationship with them, and they will reciprocate that. Now, a good script to roll on this is to ask them, you know, I always love networking with really good people, right? Do you have a really good financial advisor you're working with? Do you like them? Or your CPA is usually the question. And they'll either say, man, my CPA is amazing. And then you say, great, can I get their contact information? I'd love to actually network with them. I'm looking for a good CPA to refer to people. And then bam, that's another business partner you can talk to and add them to your group of business partners. And if they're like, nah, I don't really like my CPA, I do TurboTax, then it's an opportunity to refer somebody. Dude, I got this amazing CPA, right? Because you've met with CPAs. He's great. Is it okay if I arrange a lunch? Let's get together. He takes care of me and my family. A lot of my clients, I think he could do great things for you, right? But that's an opportunity to give back to your CPAs and your financial advisors or whoever. So work that question into the mix, right? Work that in. Listen, I want to network. I want to grow. So you'll notice that every single one of these days, there's a theme, and the theme is new business, growth, okay? Day four, last day. This is my favorite day. I love day four. This is the one I'm best at. I love calling my pre-approvals. So the unique thing about our industry, Mr. Loan Officers out there and Miss Loan Officers out there, is if you work in the car industry or the HVAC industry, you meet with a client, you make a great impression, they sign on the dotted line, and you've got a contract. Usually it's immediate. Now, the weird thing about what it is we do is you'll meet with somebody, you'll do all this work, you'll spend hours on the ultimate pre-approval, get it all set up. And then what happens? Then you lose them for a while because they got to go out there and find a place. Sometimes they lose heart. Sometimes they don't find the right place. Sometimes it can go six months. And so you don't get paid for all your work you did up front until that loan closes. And so there's a period of time where that relationship kind of, you kind of lose control of it for a little while. They, they flutter away. And so the, the power of the pre-approval check-in call every Thursday is to ask them, how's the house search coming, man? Right? Oh, by the way, rates have gone up or rates have gone down, but I'm keeping them involved in what the market's doing and I'm checking in to see how the house search is coming. Are you making offers? Are you just looking online now? I got a bunch of family stuff. I'm taking a month off. Oh man, what's going on? But it's great because if it takes them six months to find a house and you're calling every week, by the time that goes into contract, you guys are friends. 
you've talked so many times, man, they know you, you know their family. It's an opportunity to deepen connections. Now, if you're not doing this, you will lose a percentage of your free approvals because these guys are going to open houses. A lot of realtors like loan officers with them. And so there's other loan officers just waiting inside that, that open house, waiting to poach them. Oh yeah, who's your real? I can beat their rate, right? And so if you're not staying in front of all of the competition, you will lose, not all of them, but you'll lose a percentage. I had a lady actually called me yesterday. She hasn't picked up the phone in three months on a pre-approval call. But she calls me, leaves a voice and she's like, Doug, I so appreciate you keeping me involved. Looks like my pre-approval is about to expire. I just got to know what I got to give you to update. I'm like, wow, she called me back. It's been three months, right? But I don't take that stuff personally. I'm leaving messages all day long. I like doing that. I get into a rhythm. I feel like I'm, I'm doing what I need to to grow. So pre-approval calls. Um, that's, that shouldn't be. <laughs> that's not right. So just, just pre-approval check it. That means you're right, okay? <laughs> that's from the last slide. Um, so guys, it's a simple formula. It's four days. It's contacting new business partners. It's value adding to your existing business partners. It's contacting your pipeline. Taking advantage of opportunities that just come to you to get more business. Not enough loan officers are getting current client referrals. Not enough loan officers are asking their current clients, man, can you think of anybody who could benefit from my services? This is where we are weakest as an industry. Not enough of us are, are taking advantage of this listing agent that just came to us to impress and then earn a cup of coffee with. Some of my best agents were once listing agents. I didn't even set it up that way. They just, we did a really good job on the transaction. Things went sideways and I really stepped up and took over that relationship with the seller and made it work. And now we're, now we've been working together for years. So these are all opportunities. Look at everything you do as an opportunity to grow. And I know nobody likes cold calling and you don't have to do it forever. Eventually you will get big enough to where you can rely on days two, three, and four like I do to continue to grow at a pretty sustained pace. Okay, so I appreciate your time. Guys, this is a plug for the Voluntary Accountability Program. This is what I go over every class. We're gonna start it again January 4th and we're actually gonna give assignments. We're gonna check on those cold calls, see how you did. Are you booking the amount of appointments you need to? If not, let's re-roll play. Let's figure out what we gotta adjust to get you there. All right, guys, so I appreciate you. I'm gonna turn the time back over to Mr. Luke. Brandon up to talk about the open loan solution. A couple questions. This is a new loan officer. So you came from the engineering industry, correct? No background in loans, right? Just kind of jumped right into it. What was the most difficult thing for you to start doing when you jumped into loans? Um, well, there's a lot, right? <laughs> there's so much to learn. But I would say that I think the thing that was hardest for me is I like to feel like I'm really good at something before I go to the streets and sell it. And I didn't feel like I was good at loans. I really didn't. Like, I didn't feel like I really knew what I was talking about. And so I really had to lean on, you know, folks that were helping me. All I had was a branch manager and me. We shared a little room. It was just, it was, it was very small, but I leaned on him a lot. And so my, my, my advice would be take advantage of any opportunity you have to get training on how to do loans, how to submit loans the right way. Cause you're going to be out there making promises to people about your fast closes and your great service. But if you're not educating yourself on the origination side of it all, you're not going to be able to deliver. There's two hats you wear as a loan officer. There's the sales hat which just takes a lot of confidence and not being afraid to get out there and talking to people. And then there's the actual ability to be analytical and originate loans. And you got to build both of those together or it's, you're going to work really hard for relationships that are going to end up not turning into anything because you just drop the ball on the loan. So what's your recommendation? So I'm a new loan officer, right? And I, I'm saying when I want to know what I'm talking about before I cold call Doug Ross, who's been a realtor for 10 years, right? What's your recommendation? What's my timeline? Is it two weeks of learning? And then start making the calls, or I just make the calls and wing it and kind of see where I end up. Like, where do I start? First off, I say dive in. Always dive in, right? Because that's how you're going to learn. You got to make a decision and run with it. Too many people are on the fence their whole life, not knowing which direction to go. Man, just pick a direction and run. And the faster you go, the sooner you're going to figure out if it's the right direction or not. So it's, it's on the ground. You just got to learn. And just, I sell the fact that I work as a team. I have a team of people who have a lot of experience. I'm new, but that brings hunger and availability. I'm hungry and I want to close and I want to grow. I'm not that 20 year veteran who's just coasting at this time. I want to be there for your people on a Saturday morning, on a Monday after six. That's me. And I, I, where I lack knowledge personally, I lean on my team. I got a great team behind me, great trainers, and I know how to submit loans quickly. And if I have a question, I know where to find the answer. So that I was uncomfortable with that sell, but I had to, I didn't have a choice. And then after a year or so, right, then they're like, okay, I'm a little more confident in this arena. I can actually, I have some stats to back up what I'm doing. 
same. So, so what's what's a realistic goal then for my first twelve months? Like, what, um, what's a realistic closing loan goal for my first twelve months? Um, I would say that it's probably going to take you two to three months of really trying before you can get that consistent one to two loans closed a month. So I would say by the end of, you know, six to 12 months, you should be able to close two to three loans a month. That's like, because you got enough business partners at that point that are feeding you often enough to where you're creating some sense of consistency. So you'd say first 12 months, 20 loans would be a, a solid goal. Be really good. Be a really good goal. And yeah. then I, I mean, obviously as I continue to grow and I, my business, you know, I start getting more comfortable and understanding what I'm doing. What does that next 12 months look like? Like where do, do my goals double? Like where am I at as far as goals wise goes in that next 12 months, my year two? Your first couple, your first couple of years, yeah, you're gonna start doubling all your stats because year one you start at zero business partners. And if you follow the plan, by the by the end of year one, beginning of year two, you have like 90 business partners now. And then by the end of year three, you've got well over a hundred business partners. And so you have more people that are feeding you. So it's kind of like a snowball, it starts out slow and small, but then it starts really getting big. And then you got to hire help because you can't keep up with all the business because it's raining so hard all the time. All right. Well, hey, last question, right? I hate cold calling people. Yes. Said, how long do I have to do that we before do. I can stop? How uh, long do I have to do that before I'm closing 100 loans a year and I don't have to make those calls? <laughs> you know, it's going to be everyone, everyone kind of levels up at their own pace, right? I'd say that when you get to be about 100 business partners, uh, solid business partners you met with, they said they'll send you business and they're starting to do that. I'd say you could dial it back to maybe one appointment a week. And then when you get to, I mean, it's going to be a personal decision, but when you get to about 150, you can just stop cold calling altogether. You got a big enough empire to where now it's the follow up, it's the value add to all the people I'm working with. Because too often we, we spend so much time planting and we kind of neglect the field. We neglect the people that we're already working with. And so that's going to look differently for everybody. And some people never level down, some people just hire assistants. They hire cold callers and they just keep growing, right? Edge Effort is talking about people who are 500 million a year, right? And if that's your goal and you want to keep it that trajectory, eventually you're just going to run out of time in the day. And that's when you either make a decision to dial back or you hire help. And that, that usually takes about a year or two before you're in that position where you got to start hiring or dialing back. Beautiful. Well, we appreciate you. We'll bring you in. Well, I got a question real quick. Uh, so I used uh, top of mind my first couple of years and then when I came aboard with Robert uh, three years in I changed it to uh, Jungo 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 everyone pronounces it differently you just need something where you have the ability to blast your database and you have the ability to when you get a new lead Put them into a campaign that's reminding you to do your follow-ups and sending them a monthly email that you're CCing your business partner on. You know, when you showcase the follow-up that you do to their leads, you've got to include them in that. And so my CRM, whenever I text somebody, call somebody, Facebook message somebody, I drop a note to the realtor, hey, I just did this. Just so you know, this is the third time I tried them, call me back. Hey, just so you know this and that. So they know, they feel involved and they can see me working behind the scenes. Again, that first, that first lead is an opportunity for you to flex your muscles and show how great you are. And if you're doing everything behind the scenes, you're not telling them, they don't know everything you're doing. So it's important to find a CRM that involves your business partner. I just click a box to inform the business partner. I put the notes in there, had a great conversation. They're not going to fill out the application until, you know, next Sunday because they had a family emergency. And then boom, my business partner knows exactly where that file sits. So hey, there's not one great, I mean, that's just the one I use, but I've heard other great ones that are free. Jungo cost me about a hundred bucks a month. Um, and until you get a, a database to where you're hundreds and hundreds of people, that's when you're going to want to try to get some kind of CRM. Just track it so you can drop all that data into the CRM. There's lots out there. You've talked to a lot of people. There's a lot. Wow. We got to follow that, huh, Brando? That's, I don't know that we can follow that. Look well, good. Well, so, you know, what we've heard so far today is we heard a little bit about, you know, goals, what we did last year. Um, you know, we're going to talk more about our goals for, for next year. And then Robert came up and, oh my gosh, I don't know about you, but, uh, you know, I'm always excited about what I call the mailbox money, uh, building something, uh, building a legacy, something that uh, can follow us into retirement. Um, and then Doug came up and, and Luke, you helped him just talk about the, the daily activities. This is actually the sweat and blood. And I've got to tell you one thing that he didn't talk about that he has.
John knows what it is. He has enthusiasm. Doug shows up like a thousand watt bulb in that room and just shining. And it's, it's, an, it's contagious, isn't it? Yeah. It got me pumped up watching it. So all of you have those abilities. So, so now you're a, a newer loan officer out there. Luke was talking about that. And you're like, well, that's great for you guys because you know this. So that's great for you. And I tell people when they, when they start with us that there's just one thing that they need to master. And if you master this one thing, then when you go talk to these realtor partners, you'll have the follow through. You'll be able to do it. And this one thing, um, Brandon, when he came on board 16 months ago, 17 months ago, working part time, worked for PG&E, worked part time at this, not really part time, part time PG&E, part time at this. No, he came on board and quickly he latched on to this one thing and it was you even gave it a name. You gave it the ultimate approval or pre-approval or something. Yeah. So, so we have quite a few different. We, the ultimate is great. We love ultimate. You know, you're doing such a great job. So, so really, what it starts with is that thorough pre-approval. That's where everything starts, right? That's where the money's made or the money's lost for us. And so, I see it as a couple key items that are going to get you set for success. So, it starts with that pre-approval, that very thorough pre-approval, not a pre-qualification. You've heard of that, right? I have. So, let's let's just stop right there. So, you're you're a new loan officer. You're getting back into the business. Learn this one skill, because this one skill will set you up for success. One. It'll I think just, so. It'll make you dominate in the business, and you'll be as good as Doug at this. That's just right. this one thing, right? And just like Doug said, we have proof. It's worked for us. It's been working for us, and it will continue to work. And so... So that thorough pre-approval, we're not doing a pre-qualification, we're going full in depth, we're having them complete a full application, we're running credit, we're getting income docs, we're getting asset docs, we're reviewing that credit report, and we're going to issue a full AUS approved pre-approval letter. This is gold, this is good, you can hand it to your agents, your realtor partners, hey, this is good, this loan's going to close, 21 days, 17 days, heck, give me 14 days, I'll close this in that turn time. And you know if you can get a property inspection rate waiver, if you have the property address as well. So for those listings that you want to know if you get a PIW, we can do that. So that's the upfront pre-approval that we'll do that you should be doing for quick, you know, success. So does that mean like I have to really get the W-2s? Get W-2s, get those pay stubs. I have to get the pay stubs, payments. but they told me they make 6000 a month. Well, that's one thing, but it's, it's typically not it. You want to get all the pages too, right? We don't want to miss any pages. Do I even have to look at the credit report? <laughs> yes. Every page. So, and, and we have classes. Doug's done excellent classes. Everybody's done classes on this. So you you can learn how to read the credit report, how to learn how to read W twos, 1099s, tax returns, self employed. That's huge. A lot of self employed these days. Those are our money makers. Those are our big loans. So let's just uh, role play for a second here on how you get somebody to to give you documents. Because a lot of us are like, wait, I don't want to ask for that or ask for the wrong thing. So. You're really good at it. I know you, you, you've seen the light on how to do it here. I've learned the hard way over the years how to do it. But, you know, the, the thing you've got to do is you've got to understand people want to know four things when they're talking to you. They, of course, want to know what your interest rate is because that's the only thing they know to ask. They want to know what their payment's going to be, right? Because that's reality. They want to know how much their cash to close is, right? but they never tell you they want the fourth thing. The fourth thing they wanna know is, am I approved? Can I qualify for this? And that's where you have the leg up. You know that they're not asking that fourth question, but you know they wanna know that question. So turn it around. Hey, Brandon, I see you gave me the pay stubs, you did this, this is where we're at, but I need more information so I can really help you and get this thing fully approved up front. And usually if you lean in and explain why you need it, what happens? It ultimately ends up in success because you're going to do your job that's going to help them close on that new home and you're going to do a great job for those agents as well. So it's going to be that ball rolling down the hill. And if somebody won't give you all the documents up front, then don't issue the approval letter. I know that's, I know the agent's going to be pushing on you, but just kind of push back. I just wanted to start that because too many times the old pit has kind of run into battle and maybe didn't have all the documents with me, right? But I would never do that in today's world, right? That's right. No, you should never. You should never. All right. So take us through. We're at this ultimate, uh, the ultimate approval up front. And, and then how does that, 
segue into the ultimate submission and why is ultimate on the pre-approval and submission so important? So, so it's these key items that's going to get us down that road to success. So it starts with that pre-approval, that thorough pre-approval we just went over. So we're going to do that. And as soon as we get into contract, that's when we're actually going to get that loan and we're going to do that ultimate submission. And we have a document that we've created. Um, it may be available to you right now to look at. It's available in our back office as well. Uh, so we call it the ultimate loan process. So, so I broke it down into kind of four phases. And so that first phase is, you know, that initial application stage, that pre-approval, and we're doing that ultimate submission. And once we get that submitted, oh, we have it here. There you go. Um, now they have this on the screen at home, so perfect. they're all seeing it. Perfect. So we broke it down. I think it's three, yes, yeah, three pages or so. And and this is kind of the rundown of, of kind of what we see a loan process is for the ultimate loan process. And so you're doing that pre-approval up front, and then you're going to get that loan submitted. You're going to make sure you check all those items to get that early CD out. You're going to use bolts. You're going to use all these items that are great lenders, especially UWM has for us. And from there. It's easy. It's an easy close. You're going to do it fast and easy. And from that, you're being efficient. And being efficient means that your clients are going to come back to you again, and you're going to get referrals. Those agents are going to want to come back to you again. You're going to get more referrals because you did such a good job, such a thorough job up front. So I, I put in all the work up front. It makes the closing really easy. It's really, it's really ironic. As an originator, you make you know five, seven thousand dollars on a transaction. And you make that money on the pre-approval. That's really where you bank and make your money. And if you do a slacky, a half-assed job on it, you're maybe not going to make your money. You're going to get into contract, and then you're going to find out, oh, I didn't notice this. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't notice this. And then you're on the defensive. And then you're not going to impress the agents. You're not going to impress the borrower. You're going to be hiding from that phone call, and you're going to hate the mortgage business. And so don't do that. So they'll love the mortgage business. You really spend time up front. Now, if, if somebody gives you something and you don't understand it or you have more questions about it, what are some of the things that you do? Because I know we've talked about this. We've seen it. So as far as the documentation. The documentation. So let's talk about it. And let's so uh, when, when, when you have a client, maybe give you a little feedback, like they disagree. Is that what you're asking about? On well, or they give you a document. You, you know, you're not sure about what the document says or how much money they really make. Like, what do you do in those situations? So we ask for more documentation, right? So we're gonna prove that. And, and also what's great about PWM is we have mentors, we have leaders who can help us review those documents even more thoroughly to, to find out what's really going on. So more documentation now is always better. So we wanna get as much documentation as we can to prove our case because we're handing that off to the underwriter and they're going to review everything even more thoroughly, fine tooth comb, because they have to hand off that loan to their ultimate investor, their end investor, to have it approved. So, so we want more documentation. The the new word of the day is the, is bolt. And I, I was Brian and I were looking at bolt this morning. Um, and, and what bolt does is bolt allows you to take your pre approval, your TBD, and actually walk it all the way down the path. And it forces you. What's great about it is it forces you to parse your document. It forces you to label things correctly. It forces you to do the basics really well. So I would really lean in if you're listening right now and you're saying, well, I don't quite have that skill set. You've got to develop this skill set so then you can go out and do what Doug was talking about, right? This is the basis of the whole thing. Absolutely. I mean, so you know what you're talking about when you talk to those clients because you don't want to get on that phone call, you're in the middle of a loan, and then they're asking you questions, you know, did you run AUS, is there DU? You know, some agents are pretty smart out there, they know what they're talking about, and, and they're gonna ask you questions you better have answers for. And so you wanna know the loan process start to finish, that's why I always recommend, you know, do the whole loan yourself, you know, learn how to do an entire loan before you hand it off to team members to work on it with you. Know what you're talking about so you can talk to your clients, you can talk to your agents, and you show them, hey, I know my stuff, Give me more business. Let's let's keep working together. So on that part of it, the, the phase I want to talk about is my delegmatai phase, my favorite phase when we get to it. Walk us through, Brandon. Hey, we we are about to get clear to close. Walk us through clear to close to to get in the paycheck. Walk me through that. So that closing stage. So so we we love getting there. We love getting that email. You get a phone call from your underwriter. Hey, we're clear to close. Thank you so much for working on this with me. That's the best thing. So the first thing you're going to do that I would do is I'm going to send out whether it be a text or a phone call to directly to my clients. I'm going to let them know, hey, your loan's clear to close. I'm going to do my my job now to work with the escrow company, the title officer, 
and we're gonna we're gonna get this loan to closing through closing and get you signing docs so you can get into your home. Next call, we're gonna make another call to both the uh, the agents, the listing agent and our uh, our buyer's agent. We let them know, hey, we're clear to close. This is where we're in the process. We may ask you for a little help here at closing to get us there quicker. So we, we this is where we're starting to to lead towards a collaboration stage because we're gonna get the escrow officer, the agents, and yourself, along with the UWM closing team, all together to get those closing docs out as quick as possible. They have a great U-close system there that, that gets the loan from, from start to finish and closing, really. You can really get closing docs out in less than an hour. You know, if everything's ready to go, you can go from CDC, CTC to closing docs on the table at the escrow office within an hour. You know, the success that, that Doug and I are having, Brandon's now having, other people are starting to have it, it's with a system that allows the originator to be in control. It was, uh, you know, obviously when I started in 1988, we weren't burning CDs and we weren't emailing. We were, it was, it was bad back then. It's great now, trust me. But my life changed in about 2016 in about November when I had a stack of loans and my processor was gone. And that was the first time that I in my career took a loan from you know, underwriting through the closing. And I can tell you, it's so empowering. One of the things I talk about when I'm talking about people coming to our company is I'm gonna show you not, not only great stuff, but I'm gonna show you a skill of how you're going to be able to process, originate, close your first 10 loans yourself. Yeah, do it, your first 10 loans. You're gonna get some frustration, but that's good because you're gonna work through that. And you're going to develop such a skill that you're going to understand that process and you're going to be so helpful through the rest <laughs> of your career. Our partners at United Wholesale Mortgage, if you haven't gone to success tracks, you're missing out. If They make it free. If you have not taken the time to go on to the success tracks, you are not going to become a professional loan officer. Professional loan officer is Brandon, closing three or more loans a month. He was able to start closing loans. I'll never forget it. He called me up and he goes, Pity, I just quit PG&E. We're doing this full time. How'd that make me feel? I was a little scared for a second. I go, that's mailbox money, PG&E, and you're going to be doing this. But what he did is he came in and learned that skill and learned that skill set. Yes, we're a broker. Yes, you can go to many lenders. And I, there's nothing wrong with going to a bunch of lenders. But when you take a loan to a lender, think about it. You have to learn their system. Yes, you have to learn their system. There's no magic to it. So my suggestion is you start with the best lender out there in terms of usability, and that's the UWM system. They're the backbone of our company right now, and you learn this process so that you can take your loans, do an incredible job up front on the pre-approval, and then what happens when you're in contract and you've done a pre-approval, incredible pre-approval? We know the loan's easy. It's, you're 100% unless something catastrophic happens, you know, but you know that loan's going to close. You know you're going to hit your dates, and it makes you feel confident to get that loan to closing real quick. A lot of times on a loan up front, the, the one area that we really have questions on, I think credit's pretty easy. The credit report comes. You can look at credit. It's kind of black and white. The value of the property, that's not something we really have to do with. I think cash to close is pretty easy to understand. They have it, they're gonna get it, they don't have it, but but it's income, isn't it? It's calculating the income. That seems to be the problem with loans that aren't going somewhere. It's usually the income, mm -hmm. isn't it? Debt to income ratio is huge, but it's yeah, does that income qualify? You know, you have income right now, but we have to look back two years. We have to look at all of the income and what type of income, variable income, commission, salary, what type of income is it, and how do we qualify them based on that? So that's huge. You need to really learn how to look at the income, not just take, okay, I see a pay stub, here's what they're making. That's not the whole picture. We need to look at the whole picture so we know exactly what their income is, get that DTI ratio exact so we know exactly how much they can afford. You know, It's not a gray area here. This is also black and white. Mm -hmm. That's what I like. You know, I want it to be black and white so I know exactly what your, your ceiling is. You know. Yeah most you can afford, and then from there it's easy. So fluctuating income, I know on Loan Lab we've talked about fluctuating income. The reason I'm bringing out fluctuating income because it seems to be the number one thing that you and I could about 
on a file on a daily basis, right? Yeah, we go back and forth quite a few times trying to nail down exactly what we think the income is. And especially if your client's self-employed, you get the pleasure of, of having corporate returns, 1120s, and you get all this different income. There's there's some great resources. So I know um, in our training, we're doing a great job of talking about it. I know on Loan Lab, we talk about it. Doug probably even talks about an accountability, but sometimes you need to take it a step further. So we've had files that we didn't understand the income. We, we've convinced about it and we kind of thought we were. And so we got actual solid answers on those TBDs up front. And how do we do that? Yeah, so the TBD scenario is great at UWM. So it just costs a thousand partner points. You know, you close one loan there, you're going to have those partner points. The TBD scenario is basically it's a 24 hour turn time. You submit all these income docs, whatever your scenario is, you submit your whole income doc package and an actual underwriter, a senior underwriter there at UWM will review it and break down exactly what their income is each year, what you can use for income, and they'll give you a full you know, text paragraph on what they see. They're also going to call you and talk to you about it if you got some questions. So I think they're great. I've used it probably three or four times on ones where it's a little gray to me. And I want a solid answer because I got an important client and I don't want to screw anything up. I want to make sure the underwriter already tells me, here it is, this is what it's going to be, this is what you're going to close with. So it's great. It is. So I, the, the basis of what we do, you guys, is we've learned a skill here of this ultimate pre-approval, this ultimate submission. And now when you're doing and employing what Doug was talking about a second ago, which was incredible, by the way, and I agree, the, the Monday of cold calling, that was always the hardest part. Um, I'm going to talk about some other strategies, but day two and three is where I live right now. I live in day two and three, the update day, talking to your business partners and your past clients. Um, I, I love that kind of stuff, but I, I love the fact that as a new loan officer coming in right now, um, if you're new, if you're new to the industry, um, you have a leg up. You have a leg up. The, the veterans of the world, the, the pit millers of yesteryear, um, and Luke will attest to this when we were working together before, we didn't do it so much as a technician. We allowed or relied on processing. A typical originator out there is told, just go get documents, just go get the deal, and, and we'll take care of it. Just go out there and get more deals. And that's kind of hollow when you do that. What's really exciting right now is Adam, who's going to be up here next. Adam came into the, comes into the world as a new originator now. And I can guarantee you three years from now, he's going to be out originating me. A year from now, Brandon's going to be out originating me. And the reason being is they've come in and they've had that hat on that it's a little bit of a technical part of the business. Uh, you engineers like this, it's... Uh, it's, it's numbers in black and white. And Pity's not so good at that world, but I do push the buttons and even I can do my own loan, which is pretty amazing. And I think I'm pretty proud of that, although I'm clunky. But you guys are coming in and learning this skill set. So, Brandon, I, I know it's the ultimate submission, ultimate pre approval, but what would you say you know, to the future Adam, to yourself a year, a year and a half ago when you started? What would you say about this process now looking back? It's good because I, I came from a very similar world to Doug. So very analytical. I wasn't in the sales side. I was scared of the sales side, calling people, all that talk, trying to get more business. You know, that was foreign to me. And so I, I stood with what I was good with and I learned the systems. So that was me. I learned the systems. I learned how to get a loan from start to finish as quick and efficient as possible. And so that from there, I learned how to talk to people, talk to my clients, talk to them about their loan <laughs> rates, you know, everything that goes on behind the scenes of a loan, that's where I grew from. And that's how I got better to be able to talk to clients. And as soon as you start talking to clients, they, they learn that you know what you're talking about. Your relationships are going to get much better, much stronger. They're going to grow. You're going to get more referrals. So, so take what you're good at and build upon that. Don't try to just start building on something you don't know. Take what you're good at, build on that, learn the systems, learn the processes, and then get mentors like Pitt. You've been such a great mentor to me. Use your mentors and help build with them. Let them help you where you're, you know, less, lesser at, you know? Yeah. So what's the one thing that you would say a, a new person needs to do? Like they haven't done a loan yet. They've kind of done a loan. What's the one thing, wh where do they need to really start? And uh, I think they need, the training is obviously the start. They need to train, they need to learn all the systems. We have a great training in place that I'm just gonna be part of here. Um, so the training is great, but also go out there and just, I think you get that first loan, get a loan, and then work 
through that loan. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to drop the ball, but you're going to learn. We're all going to learn when we make mistakes and you're going to do better the next time. So that's what I'd say. Just go get a loan and start working. I love that. I love that. I know, uh, Mel, you're out there. Close your first one. Adam closed his. Brian's about to reclose his first loan in 15 years or whatever, being an originator. And I love that. I love seeing you guys and gals struggle a little bit through it, but that's okay because there's a lot of support and a lot of backstop. And I'd love to say in our industry, you know, on a loan, nobody dies if it doesn't go right. And you, you might kill a relationship, but think of it as, hey, you get a working chance. So when you're new out there, probably your friends, your family, that's where your first loan is going to come from. And I know it's going to be a little bit awkward because you don't really know exactly what you're doing, but you can figure this out and you can get through this. And, and you're a good testament to that. So, absolutely. hey guys, before before we let you guys off, can I ask you guys a few questions? Just as a brand new loan officer, love it. So, so you guys talked about a lot of really good stuff, right? You know, have all these great things that we can use, right? Bolts was one of them. The TBDs, um, all of those things are awesome, but. You're talking about this pre-approval, this ultimate pre-approval. Well, I'm a brand new loan officer. Where do I start as far as what's even needed for that? Where would I go to, to learn what's needed? You know, because that really is the start of it, right? I need to fully understand what I need before I can start gathering income documents and things like that. So let's say I'm, you know, my first month is January, 2022. What can I commit to in January, 2022, so that I have a really good year as far as my pre-approvals go? Take it first. <laughs> so, so learning the pre-approval. So we're all going to learn the application process. You know, we have Blink as our application source. I'd say the first thing you do is do your own application. Go through the application yourself. Learn what you're looking at as far as doing an application so you know when your clients go in there and they have questions, you can help them. So do an application yourself. And then we have all this training. We have all these classes that tell you what are the key items. You know, you've heard of those six key items you need for every loan. There's really more than six. You want to get six is the minimum. You want to get all those key items and i know we have documents in the back office we had a document up just now so there's all these documents that are going to spell out exactly what they are but ask ask your mentors ask around what else do i need to get that pre-approval done because what i do is personally i i have a template i have a template that i go by for all my pre-approval i have a refinance template and i have a pre-approval for a purchase template so either way you know we're kind of doing a pre-approval on both of them um so i have a template of Here's the documents I need, bulleted items. These are what I need, you know, fill in their name and so forth. So it's these easy templates. So I don't have to go back and remember, what do I need? What is this? So I set up templates for myself in my email. This is exactly what I'll need. That's my way of getting a pre approval done. I think the most important thing is you just start, you go to a family member and start refinancing their loan. I, I'll even tell you this, go ask a family member to refinance their loan, take them all the way down the path and don't close it. I'll, I'll tell you to do that. You are going to learn and you are going to be then responsible and you're going to start to understand the system. So I love how he said, get in blink, fill out your own blink. In the back office there, we have the document list of the documents that you really need, but try just, you're going to fail a little bit, but you're going to succeed and you're really going to learn by getting your hands in there and pushing the buttons. Learn from your mistakes. Don't let them go. Learn from them. So what I'm hearing, if I'm, if I'm looking to build my business in 2022, if somebody brand new, the first thing I need to do is commit to learning what I need, right? Setting up some email templates, really understanding the documentation of how to get that pre-approval going. Now you're talking about using UWM as a system, right? And all the systems that I have in place. Well, I don't have a loan, right? I, I would love to start somebody's refinance, but I don't have anybody in my family that wants me to do that. How am I going to learn UWM systems? without having the active loan going? Where would I start in my first month as a loan officer? Well, I, I don't have it up and running, but they actually, in their resources, they actually have a lot of videos that they can show you and walk you through it. And I've watched them and they're about three to five minutes long. Talk to your rep, because we all have a rep there and, and go through those videos at UWM under resources. That's a great place to start right now. And listen, if you want to go to success tracks, and you don't have the partner points, call me, call Doug. We'll get you the partner points. If you want to go, we'll take the time. We'll make sure that you get there. Yeah, success track is huge. Your AE, every one of our lenders we work with have AEs. They're going to be able to walk you through your systems, their systems rather, so you know exactly what you're doing. The videos are there, reference those. 
We've done our own loan, loan lab, you know, special loan submission videos. That document you put up, we've walked through that whole document. I think it's on YouTube. A full loan start to finish, and we can bounce around different loans. Um, so we do those trainings every month or so. Um, just if you can't find the answer, ask. Don't stay silent. Ask. So if I'm committing to building my business in 2022, first of all, I need to learn what I need to start a loan. Mm -hmm. And then I need to understand the systems. And place. a great resource for me would be my account executive, the trainings at UWM obviously is a great resource. So let's say that I'm six months in the business or a year in the business or two years or 20 years, right? Brandon, I know you're, you're a UWM expert. What one thing would you say I should leverage in 2022 to build my business? What one UWM thing would I use to build my business? That's easy. That's it. This is a chip in. It's the, the <laughs> golf. It's right there. Either you can make the putt. A gimme? A gimme? A gimme. We'll take that one. Uh, I think it's the ultimate loan submission with them is you hit their checklist, that early CD checklist. So they have this thing called the ultimate loan submission. You need six key items out of eight. You hit those items. You learn about those items for AE. They'll go over them. If you do that, I mean, you're going to be able to do loans in 14 days or last we've done a lot of these hit those key items you're set up for success so the ultimate loan submission loop that's what i would say so we want to commit to understanding the documentation we need what you the process that uwm have in place and obviously i can reach out to my AE. and then the number one thing if i want to grow my business in 22 would be understanding and really do being able to do the ultimate loan submission with my eyes closed right absolutely just yeah. get every loan and that ultimate loan submission get that early cd out get everything done so that's we can right. close those loans in 14 that's right, because as part of that ultimate loan submission, you need a certain amount of documents. You need that full pre-approval done. So when you combine those things together, that is the ultimate loan submission. And once you get good at that, loans are fast and easy, right? To, or easy and fast. Yeah. So I'm committing. So if I'm in 2020, I'm committing to Doug's cold calls, right? I'm committing to, to all of what comes with that. And then I'm committing to understanding the systems, mm -hmm. understanding our system and what we need in documentation, but also understanding our number one lender systems and what they offer to us. Right. Love it. I'm on board. Awesome. Good job. All right. Well, let's give these guys a round of applause. We're going to bring Adam up. All right. As Adam's coming up here, come on up, Adam. As, as Adam's coming up, you guys, I, I just want to say you just need one. You just need one realtor to be successful. Um, if you have that one realtor, you will come on over, Adam, because he's, he's it. If you have that one realtor, just start with one. And what I mean, we had this conversation because yeah. what are you going to talk about? You're brand new, Adam. I don't even know what are you doing here. You just brand I new? Have no idea. You have no idea. Up. Okay, that's going to be But you're going out to talk to that realtor. You're brand new. What's the one thing you're actually going to have that conversation about? With regard to open house? Well, not open house. Okay. Just the, what's the one skill that you think you have? I have the ultimate pre-approval process where I can get your buyer qualified and ready to make a strong offer. And you can do that. And I can do that. And I'm really good at it. And how long have you been in the mortgage business? One whole month. <laughs> <laughs> you guys, I love this business because when I started, it was much harder than that. So, so Adam's up here. Thank you, Adam, for coming up here. I, you know, I, I want to start by saying um, I see this conversation all the time. And I always go like this when the conversation happens. And Luke knows what I'm going to talk about because when I first met Luke, it was that. And, and this is buying leads. Yeah. PD don't buy leads. I don't know how to buy leads. And I'm going to tell you, don't. I know somebody out there is going to go, but fine. I don't know how to do it. I tell everybody, if you find me a loan officer making over a half million dollars anywhere in the country, we all have one thing in common. I guarantee it. It is the realtor pillar. It's that tree of the realtors. The realtors are out there. They're like the linemen in football. They're blocking and tackling and they're doing the open houses. And then they have somebody and they're all, no, they have all cash. No, they need a loan. They're like, oh, you need a loan. Well, then they need to turn around and give it to somebody on their team. And Adam here is now that skilled receiver quarterback. You're the sexy person out there in the football field. And so that's our relationship. The realtor knows that he or she is in charge of this whole transaction, but they know that transaction isn't going to close if the financing's not done. And that's what makes it so exciting to work with our realtor partners. They, 
I tell them that I'm in a play, but I only do the bit part, but I've got the most important part because without me, the play won't close, the play won't happen. And so I always like to talk about something that you can do. You're brand new. You've been in the business a day, a month? What was your start date? It's like the beginning of November. Wow. Okay, it seems like longer than that. You've been in a month and you want to go out and get that realtor business. And, and Doug was talking about cold calls. I'm scared to make cold calls, you guys. I would be scared to that. I have to do it in today's world. You're going to have to do some of that. And you've already done some of that. But I want to talk to you about the ultimate open house strategy. Ultimate open house strategy. So let's talk about your story. I know Paul's in the back back here. So it started with uh, Paul Rogers, um, great, uh, great realtor, good friend, and we're kibitzin. And his strategy as a realtor is to do open houses. And that's a great strategy is to do open houses. And so, hey, Pitt, if you ever have somebody that could come out and do the open house, because Pitty's not doing the open house, send them on out. And, oh, Adam. So Adam, I called you up and that was what, about three weeks ago. Right. Yeah. Probably didn't know what you were doing, right? I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Okay. Yeah. Wait, what, what happened? Tell me about this open house. How did you handle it? And, and, and what's the one thing somebody has to do at these open houses? Uh, so I showed up and you're sitting there, you're going to sit there with the realtor and you have really one job. And when, right, right when they come through the door, you're going to ask them, do they have a house to sell? And if they do, you're going to introduce them to that realtor that you're sitting there with and you're going to say, hey, this is a uh, good friend, Mr. Realtor. Uh, he's really good at what he does. How about we send an appointment for you to go through the next steps of what you need to do um, for getting your house ready uh, to sell? So that one thing is, let's say it again. So yeah. I'm walking into the open house. Hey, can I walk into this open house? Sure. Yeah, come on in. Do you have a house to sell? Wait, let's try that okay. again. I'm coming up. <laughs> knock, knock, knock. I, can I come in your open house? Absolutely. Come on in. All right, great. All right. Okay. Hey, my name is Adam Lyman. Nice uh, to meet you. I'm a loan officer. What's your name? Okay. Okay. Good to meet you. Um, are you look? Are you selling a house? Just buying? Right. What are you going for? And you okay. have to answer yeah. that question. So you notice that question is the epicenter of it all, because the the realtor doesn't need you there to talk about the school districts and talk about this house because you're going to suck at that. They know how to do that. They are the experts on the marketing of it, and you don't need to follow them around. You need to set yourself up strategically, introduce yourself, and ask, again, ask that question one more time. Do you have a house to sell? Do you have a house to sell? And if they have a house to sell, you want to set an appointment for that realtor to come show them what they can do to get top dollar for that house. Show them what they need to do to get the house ready. What you don't want to say is, hey, I'll set Paul up to come on a listing appointment because then that'll bomb everything right there. You don't want to use that word. You want to use, hey, how can we show you, some, give you something? Because if they have a house to sell, they're wondering, like, how am I going to get top dollar for it? And this agent that you're with is going to be the key. So what happened? You went to an open house. Yes. Was it Saturday or Sunday? It was Saturday. Saturday. And what time did you get there? What time did you leave? I think I showed up at around 11, left at 3. Wow. Okay. And so tell me what's happened since that open house. Okay. What's um, come of it? From that open house, I got, I was able to get a referral from the realtor, the Paul that I was working there with. And then I also was able to meet a realtor that came in with their client that came in the, to the open house, was able to meet with him, realized that he only had two people that he uh, was as loan officers and he wasn't really happy with one of them. So I ended up getting his phone number. I called him uh, on Monday and we've been in talks and now he wants to be a business partner with me. So I've gotten two pretty solid leads just from that four hours I spent on Saturday. So let me get this right. You've been in a business a month. You now have two realtor partners. You did an open house, but this gets better, you guys. Check this out. So one of the buyers coming through was Nurse Nancy. Yes. Nurse Jackie. Yeah. Or, I love that show. <laughs> Nurse Jackie, right? It was Nurse Jackie. Yeah. And uh, what happened with Nurse Jackie? Um, so she came in. She didn't... Uh, she was in kind of talks with a lender I was and uh, didn't quite have an agent. I was going through her with the uh, pre-approval process and then I realized that she had a, a lender or a realtor at that point. Um, she wasn't quite sure about a realtor as I was uh, walking her through the pre-approval process and I was actually able to bring her back 
uh, to uh, the realtor, Paul, who I was working with at that open house on Saturday. So I was able to help her with this loan and also bring her back to my realtor uh, partner as well. And so get this straight, because he called me and he goes, Pity, this is kind of weird. I got her pre-approved, yeah. but she has another realtor at Stop Paul, right? Yes. And we said, hey, make sure you redirect her back to Paul, because that's who introduced. Right. And of course, Paul did an amazing job, but where is that deal today? What happened? Just got in under already today, or yesterday. So it got in contract. <laughs> so wait, you've been in the business a month. A month. You've got two business partners. Yeah. You've done one open house. You closed the refinance, and now you have a purchase transaction bill. 650000 650000 Doug, watch out. we got somebody <laughs> hot on your trail. Now, you guys, this can happen. This is true. What I wanted to bring up this open house with was it's that simple to do. So if you're out there, don't overcomplicate this. Ask somebody if you can do an open house with them. Show up and just ask that one question. And then when you get your follow-up going, remember to help redirect people back to that agent because that's your loyalty is back to that agent. So any questions we got out yeah, there? Yeah, yeah. So, I, you know, I'm a brand new loan officer myself. Okay. What, what was the the one big scare? Obviously, there's no way that you just walk into that thing super confident, right? No worries right. at all. What was your yeah. big, like, nerve going into the, your first open house? Gosh, I a lot, but I think probably that someone would call me out for not knowing what I'm talking about would be the big scare. Did you, but... did you have that happen at all, or somebody asked you a loan question? No, it's all. It was really honestly just about connecting with people just at a regular social level, and you can get into that stuff later. And how many people did you end up meeting at the open house? Do you think? Probably, I mean, 10, 12 people came through. Cool. And and so jumping into that first open house, obviously Pitt doesn't do open houses, so he probably just said, "Hey, Adam, you're going to go over here and you're going right. to do this." And, right. Yeah, and that's exactly how it So um, when you got there, when, when you were meeting and talking to the people, was it just kind of a soft open? How would you recommend somebody goes in and, and it should, obviously it's the, hey, do you have a house to sell? Right. Right. But I'm sure, did you get to ask that question to every person? Did you even get to talk to every person? Not necessarily every person. I mean, some people are going to come in there and not going to want to talk to you. Totally. They're going to just write you off right from the start. Um, but if they're interested and they can keep a conversation with them, that's how you can open into it and then you'll, you'll get into the big potatoes and everything. And how many open houses are you doing right now? You uh, do one, so one a week, one a, one a month? Yeah, try to do it consistent. Okay. Maybe a couple months. So if you're, if I'm a starting, starting as a new loan officer and I'm committing to building my business in 2022, what would be a good starting point, right? Doug wants me to cold call a bunch of people yeah, all right. week, right? Brandon wants me to understand everything there is to know about UWM, right? And, and yeah. now you're telling me you need to go to open houses. <laughs> yeah. Okay, what is a good starting place for me to say, I want to commit to doing this many open houses in the first six months of my career? I think a good starting point would be once a month. Once a month? Yeah. Okay. One Saturday for one Sunday a month. Not too much to sacrifice and it could produce a lot for you. And am I looking to do the open house with the same realtor all the time or, or am I trying to do a new realtor every, every month? What would you suggest there? If you could do a new realtor, then that would expand your business way more so that would be if you could get more realtors that you're doing open houses with that'd be awesome and a lot of them probably would dig you doing an open house form with them so. Mm -hmm. so you're a brand new loan officer obviously so what's your commitment what are you doing for the first 12 months do you have 12 realtors you want to get done do you have one realtor that hey i want to get really good at open houses with this right. dude <laughs> okay. right do you have commitment like that <laughs> of course yeah, yeah. And what, what is how many open houses do you want to do in your first 12 months 12 months yeah probably anywhere from 12 to 20. Okay, so if we can do one, you know, one every month and every half a month, month right around there, right. hit that number, we're, we're yeah. going to get to go. And how many realtor partners do you need to get going for the first 12 months? Yeah, how many do you need? Uh, I would like 30 into the first year. 30. Do you hear that? 30 realtor partners. So I believe that it's a rule of a third. If you have 30 realtor partners, you're going to end up getting about a third of those have a buyer each month, potentially, that you could. So if you want to start closing three loans a month or more, you need to have 30 realtor partners, really, just to kind of simply do the math. Yeah. And then the last, last thing I'll ask is, hey, so Pitt, Adam's obviously somebody that you're mentoring. He, you're helping him with the open houses, right? What if, I, what if I'm new to our company and I'm committing to doing these open houses in 2022, but I don't know who to call if somebody asked, actually asked me a question I don't know the answer to? Where would I go? Where would I start? 
what what would allow me to be comfortable in doing these knowing that I have this support behind me? Okay, so first of all, if you're new out there, you're going to want to talk to realtor partners. Um, you can find, call, ask if there's an open house. Doug talked about the UWM tool that you can search in your area to new listings. You can call up and say, hey, are you doing an open house? Do you need somebody? There's a great dynamic between male and female because if it's a female realtor for safety, a lot of times they want to have another person there. So for safety, it's a big part. But let's go back to my first open house. I remember my first open house. I remember it like tomorrow. It was, it was in Cameron Park. I was right on Country Club Drive. I picked uh, like a 400,000 house in 1988. That was a lot. And I got asked a question. I got asked a question right in front of the realtor with the borrower standing there. Do your loans have impound accounts? Do your loans have impound accounts? I did not know what an impound account was. I didn't own a home. I had no idea, but I always remember the golden rule in sales. Tim McCormick, I love that guy. He taught me this. He said, pity, when they ask you questions, you just smile and say, okay, so you want to know if my loans have impound accounts? That's a great question. Can I go find out and get back to you? I did it just like that. It was a weekend. I called 20 people in my company. Nobody answered that weekend. I On Monday, I'll never forget it, I went into the office. I went into the underwriters and I asked those underwriters if my loans have impound accounts. And oh boy, did they undress me. Like, what do you mean? You should know that. And I all brand new. And then I went back to that borrower and back to that realtor. Um, and that realtor, going back to the first realtor, she knew I was new. She saw how I answered it. She was so impressed that I followed up and that I told them I didn't know. That parlayed into one of my best relationships because she referred me out to other realtors in the office. So I think it's, it's, it's actually a, a strength that you're going to go out there and don't know everything. Now, the question is, when you get pinned down and ask that question, do you, you know, get over your skis or do you back up and say, hey, let me find that out and then show them your follow up. Show them how good you are at, at following up on stuff. Great question. Awesome. Well, hey, let's give these guys a round of applause. We will be done back up to the meeting with me. Put these guys on the spot a little bit about what 2022 looks like for them. Love this. All right. Good job, man. Well, yeah, let's pull the director up there, Doug. We're going to talk about what 22. So I want to start with, before I start with what it looks actually looks like for you guys, because yours is going to be a lot different than, than mine, than Adam's. Um, than a lot of people that are a little bit newer in this industry. I want to talk about your suggestions for 2022 for somebody who is in there for six to 18 months in this industry. Now, we've talked a lot about suggestions, right? We've talked about cold calling, about understanding UWM, about understanding the basics of starting your loan, about going to open houses. But if I'm a brand new person, right, and I want to have a great year, I want to have a great 2022, what are three things that you would say I need to commit to doing? Commit to doing. And if you're at home still listening to us, hopefully you are. Um, I suggest you pick three things that you're going to commit to doing in 2022. On a weekly basis and then a monthly basis as well. Love this question. <laughs> And, and, and there's a lot of you out there. Um, I'm looking in this room and there's quite a few of you that are newer to the business. But remember, that's actually your leg up in today's world because the typical originator out there is somebody like me that started before TRID. And a lot of us haven't gotten really good at the technical side of it and you guys are. So you actually have a leg up that you're, you're high character and you're coming into this business right now. But as Doug's pondering, I'll go first. How's that, huh? And he's very detail-oriented. I'm going to give you my version of it. So the one thing that you've got to do is you've got to get one realtor. You just have to get that first realtor. And that's a realtor that will trust you, will use you, and will give you that first deal, that one realtor. Because I firmly believe, and I've seen it over my career, you guys, is that you're going to get your next realtor 
from that realtor. That realtor, see realtors, they interact with each other because they need each other for buying and selling. Loan officers, we don't really interact with each other on deals. We don't get, unless we're trying to snipe Doug's deal, we don't get involved in his deal. But realtors collaborate more. And so trust me, when they have somebody that they're excited about, a title person, a roofer, a loan officer, that's where it's gonna go. So I think your number one thing is you're gonna get one, one realtor, that first realtor. And remember, this is in the first 16 months. And that first realtor is gonna turn into, like Adam said, 30. You, you gotta get 30 realtors. You have to get 30 realtors that are on your list, that are starting to like you, starting to talk to you, and are, are taking your phone call, are acknowledging you and giving you a deal. And at the end of that 16 months, you will be getting three closed deals a month. And I'm not real good with math, but if you make $5,000 a deal, you close three a month, you're making around $15,000, you can probably stop that other job and you can start, start doing this full time. And anybody can start with one, can go to 30, and it's gonna end up giving you three. Nice, that was really good. <laughs> so, there's what I just came up with as I heard that question. So, and it kind of parlays well into what it's talking about. So, I think the number one thing you need to do is you got to get comfortable putting yourself out there and contacting new people. Whatever that looks like, whether it's going to open houses or cold calling or whatever that looks like, you've got to get comfortable and commit to meeting a certain number of new business partners per week, right? If you're not, I, I have, there's so many talented loan officers that are probably better at origination than I am. They don't have anywhere near my business because they're not comfortable contacting new business partners. You can be really good behind the scenes, super analytical, best out there, fastest close, but if you don't get the word out, you're not going to grow. So I think you got to start there. Number two, perfect the pre-approval, right? You got to dedicate time daily to, to perfecting and mastering your job as an originator, right? Every an hour a day, whatever, coming to loan labs, going to learning the ultimate loan submission, understanding programs and new things that are out there, all the different lenders we work with, you've got to dedicate regular time to becoming good at what you do, right? Because you can talk about how great you are all day long, but you got to deliver. And so this is just as important. It's kind of a 50-50. And then third, the biggest thing, the thing I'm most passionate about in my business is following up, following up with everybody. How many times do you got to ask before you actually get the business? You got to be creative, have a plan. You're constantly following up with your business partners, with your clients, with, with everybody to get the business um, that you want. So I'd say if I had to melt it down to three things, these would be the areas of focus I'd want you to be targeting. And what's Next neat thing. is you'd use those three things with, with, mm -hmm. with your one to get your 30 to close your three. So this is actually pretty good. Oh, yeah. It's actually very, very well. <laughs> there you go. How are we do, Luke? Great. Okay, good. Okay, so hey, I want, I want you guys to write two numbers on the board to finish up. Okay, and everybody at home obviously do the same thing. I want to know how many loans you're going to do in 2022. And how many people are you going to bring to our company? Now, your number at home might be a lot different than these guys. How, these guys how many might, loans we're going to do? How many loans you want to do? So, your number at home could be a lot different. And the reason is that these guys might not want to grow their business on the loan side. They might want to stay where they're at and grow it on the recruiting side. Um, if you're a new loan officer, obviously that number could be a lot different for you than it might have been. Uh, might be for these guys. Okay, so, Ted, I'll start with you. Okay, so you want to do 91 loans in 2022. Okay. I am um, going to close 91 <laughs> loans in 2022. So everything starts at this number, yeah. right? And then we work backwards monthly, weekly, daily. So, what three things? Are you going to do weekly that you're going to commit to doing for the next 12 months on a weekly basis to make sure you hit that number? Well, to keep it in theme, I love the way Doug did it earlier, is I'm going to do day, day two, Tuesdays, and that's calling on all my deals because I love talking to the agents because they all want to talk to me, especially when we have a deal going. And the third day or the next day is talking to my database, my business partners. I'm part of a networking business group, that type of thing. Um, and then the third day is the last day is uh, the pre-approvals. So I'm going to do 91 deals this next year, and I'm only going to work three days a week to do it. So, so you're I'm committing, really going to work. So you're really, really going to work. Yeah. So you're committing, what I'm hearing is you're committing to calling your current clients, 
calling your business partners. Third thing being following uh, up with your pre-approval rules. Yeah, yeah. Which is which you guys the way Doug did that earlier. Uh, that is the gold of of how to be an originator. It really is. And Doug, you want to basically stay at the same number that you were at last year. Okay. Okay. A okay. crap ton of loans, right? Okay. So what are you gonna what what are you gonna do differently? Are you gonna do anything differently? Does it stay the same for you? I'm gonna be same. <laughs> so I got a system that's working, right? It's exactly what Pitt said. So I'm I'm not in the cold call phase in my career right now. I'm more into following up with existing business partners, value add every week. What can I bring to the table this week that's gonna get them to want to send me a deal? Um, current client referrals and new listing agents that come to me on a contract. And I'm really going to work my database. I got a big database. We got big databases now. You do this long enough, you got thousands of people doing email blasts, um, evidence of success stories. There's all things, all kinds of things you can do to stay in front of them and stay relevant. Um, but nothing replaces the annual phone call. And I really want to get, I think, beef that up a little bit because that's probably these two are where I was weakest this year. And before we get into the team building side, I really want to ask you this, Doug, because you're so system based. So I'm a brand new loan officer, right? And I, and if, the things that I want to commit to doing are understanding what I need and the systems that I have in place that you have, right? I want to cold call my business partners and grow that business. But how do I break that down into a weekly, at least for my first two months, what am I going to do weekly so that I understand my process at UWM? I don't have to do that anymore, right? I can cross that one off. How am I going to break down those first couple months so that the next 10 months are a little bit different and maybe more gaining business oriented and less understanding how to do the business. Oh man, I can't, can I get that one more time? <laughs> I want to know how I'm going to start my first two months. That's what I want to know. Okay. Because I need to understand what I'm doing before I can go out and do it. Mm -hmm. How am I going to break down my week and commit time? How would you commit time to the understanding side of it before you really went after the business part? So first off, I'm a huge advocate of the four day program, right? And really when you're new, the four day program is going to take you maybe an hour a day. Maybe it really isn't going to take that long. And how many hours are there in a week? You got 40 hours, right? When you're a brand new loan officer, trust me, there's no way you're working 40 hours, right? There's no way you're, it takes maybe two hours to do cold calls. It might take four or five hours on a Saturday to do the open house Popeyes, right? And so if you think, okay, I got 40 hours to work with here. How many hours a day am I going to dedicate to prospecting new business partners, right? And how many hours a day am I going to dedicate to mastering my craft as a loan officer? And that split's going to look different for everybody, but start with a couple hours a day, right? How am I going to get, there's a lot of trainings PWM has to offer. So Loan Lab's one of those hours and, you know, uh, you know a voluntary accountability programs, another few of those hours. So figuring out, and then you could dedicate an hour to going on UWM's website, figuring that out. Talk to your aide, ask them, hey, I got an hour a day I'm dedicating to mastering my job as a loan officer. Where would you recommend I go? Where should I start? Right? Lean on people who know what they're doing, but time block time block at least a couple hours a day to, to mastering your these two hats you're wearing of prospecting and origination so what i'm hearing if i'm a new loan officer is pick a couple trainings that i know i'm going to attend every week mm -hmm. and then pick a couple time slots throughout the week maybe it's my tuesday thursday right maybe it's just two days a week that i'm committing three hours of that day to learn and really understanding those basics so that when i have a conversation with a paul rogers right or something, a big realtor who knows what the hell they're talking about, I can feel comfortable in that conversation because I have learned enough in those time blocks of the, the learning period of our job. Yeah, so getting discipline and creating systems and time blocking to ensure that you don't lose your way along the way. When you start to get a lot of loans, you stop dedicating as much time to perfecting your craft as a loan officer, and I think that's a tragedy. You always wanna be setting aside time to being aware of the next big program because lenders, I think Pitt was talking about this. They're always releasing new stuff, right? There's always they're always changing things. They're always trying to leg up on the rest, guys. So you got to be in that. You got to be dedicating time to staying up to speed on the latest stuff going on in our industry, which means you time block. Here's my hour. I'm gonna make sure I'm just reading through. Dude, I got like I get 100 of emails a day from all of our different lenders. I don't read them all, right? But every so often I'll slow down and be like, oh, hey, they got a new program here. This is kind of cool. Maybe that's what, what I'll, I'll talk to all my realtors about this week, right? This is this new bank statement program or the fact that you can put 15% down on an investment property. That's huge. It's the first in my career. And that's going to make my next value add call on Monday to all my realtors. Okay. And then the second side of our business is, is the team building side. Okay? So you're you're committing to building your team by 15 minutes. Sorry. No, no, I, I love that. But before we go there, can I, because I, I love your yeah, question. And I just, I want to just share a real experience. Real experience was uh, I was at Capital Commerce. I had, I'd learned a little bit and I did it. And uh, I'll never forget it. Uh, Doug Jack, love Doug Jack, originator. 
Um, Doug had a client, Fran Dixon, and he, Fran at that point was one of the biggest realtors around. Um, Fran was great. I don't know how I got the nerve to do this, but I called Fran up and Fran, it's Pitt, and you know, we just started talking and I said, I'm new, I really don't know what I'm doing. Is there any way I could follow you around for a day and learn? Fran said, be at my house at 6 a.m. in Fair Oaks the next day, drove up to his beautiful house, cart by car that leaked oil on the street. I was with him from 6 a.m. when he said goodbye to his family till nine o'clock that night and I drove his big Mercedes around and we went to Stockton twice to deliver loan documents to American Savings back in the day. We went to signings at Title. I went to a listing appointment with him. I went to his office. Um, man, I, he worked hard. But if you have the opportunity to find somebody that's a good realtor, and if you want to put yourself out there, ask to follow him for the day. It was the most incredible thing for me it was. So, but I, I was, just any way you can get out there, there's, there's no rules. I think that's the best part, the best part, so. How about the team building side? You're committing to, to build your team by 15 team builders or 15 active licensed LOs. How are you going, what, what one thing are you gonna to commit to this year? To it's do 15 by that symbol that Robert loves, that, that times, times, times. So I'm doing something a little different. What I've learned here um, is I've learned it's the same amount of work to hire Adam, a single loan officer, as it is to go hire Adam, who's a branch manager and has five loan officers with him. It's going to be the same amount of work to take down a retail branch that has loan officers with them and get them to all come over. So what I'm going to do in 2015 is Shelly says, wow, that sounds like a big goal. Even Brandon said 2022. Yeah. Sorry. Brandon said the same thing. Wow, that's a big goal. I'm going to bring 15 retail branches over this next year. 15. Okay. What I mean by retail branch is I mean somebody that is not a mortgage broker because a mortgage broker is already the proud owner. They're, they're going to have a hard time with our model. A retail branch is somebody at Movement Mortgage, Guild Mortgage, um, Fairway Mortgage. These are retail shops and these people run a P&L and I've run one before. It's kind of a glass ceiling. You know, you're getting five or six loan officers to work for you. You're making some money off of them, but not enough that you can stop your production. It's just kind of this weird thing. So what I have set up is a plan and I am going to bring 15 of those people over. But the way I'm going to do it is even better. What I've learned at, at our company, our model is, is that not everybody you bring on will then grow a team. But until you get people on and they get people underneath them and they start receiving the money, the mailbox money, the passive money, they're subject to leave. We've seen this, they're subject to leave. So not only do you need to bring somebody on, but you need to help them build a team. And not everybody's going to do it, so you've got to help them. So check this out. I'm bringing on 15 branches, and not one of those branches is going to be on my front line. Not one. I am going to take those people, and I am going to put them under other originators that I've brought on. Why? Because it's going to be work. And if I bring on somebody and I put them under Luke, Luke is now on their front line. He is going to work just as hard as me to support those people. And so this next year, I'm going to bring on 15 branches with five each. So really, I'm going to bring on 75 loan officers. Wow, that's really good. <laughs> Can I change my goal? <laughs> uh, my <laughs> president, though, you're doing other things, baby. My, my goal is 25. I brought on 12, so I want to double it. Um, I, I just started the online gig, you know, four months ago. Luke and Kerrig actually helped me a lot set that up, and it's been really great. So I'm going to try and run that, really master that in 2022. That's what, what one thing would you commit to doing, Doug, on a weekly? I mean, someone like you with systems, what, what on a weekly basis are you kind of committing to to see that happen? You know, I would... I thought about this over the last few weeks, and I, th I like the online thing, and it's it's a piece. But the one thing I haven't really tapped into is my database of thousands of people who I've closed loans with. And so I am going to work into my annual call to my, 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 my clients to talk about this new company we've created 
and the opportunity and see if they're interested in learning a little bit more. So I want to I want to kind of tap into my already existing massive database with this message to maybe pull some people who already know me and are already going to have that link to it. Okay, and then hey, last thing before we go, obviously you guys have big numbers on the board. Um, someone who's in your position <laughs> or in, in a new loan officer position wants to be in your position at some point in time. Right, that's the ultimate goal is to, if you guys notice their production numbers didn't double, they didn't even go up in, in a certain case, right? But the, the, the other side of this production did go up. And this is the where everybody wants to end up. Everybody wants to end up in that, I'm producing enough now I want to team build. I want to grow, right? I want to become this loan officer where I know the money's coming. And Doug said something to me last week that was really eye-opening in that when you're making $40,000 a month, $50,000 is the same. $60,000 is the same. You're, you, you just buy the things that you want to buy. You're making the money, right? You're not making $10,000 a month. So you guys are in that position. You're making $50,000 a month, right? Good months are 75, bad months are 40. But you're making all of that money every month. What is the one big thing that keeps you driven to do this? Right? What's your big why? I want to have goals in 2022. I'm a new loan officer. I want to be in 2025 in your position, but I need a reason. Right? Is it because I want to be rich? Is that your why? There has to be something more driving you than that. Well, I think I think you know the, the whys are always personal as to what somebody has a why. Um, and, and we get into that, but I just want to say, how, how am I going to accomplish this? How is Doug going to accomplish this? We're going to use the systems we have in place, you guys. If you notice, every Monday morning at 8 a.m., every Monday morning at 8 a.m. almost, you get to hear this guy and this guy talk about a positive message. I admit, I've been on my mountain bike many times <laughs> with my earpiece in, and listen to their message, but I listen to it. I go and I try to get other people to go to the Tuesday night all company meeting. I really do. Why? Because again, you get Doug showing up, you're showing up, I'm showing up, Robert is, we're helping each other and I'm not having to do all the lifting. I always recommend you go to Loan Lab, mainly because I love Loan Lab and loans are fast and easy, easy and fast, but you'll see that it's real scenarios, real stuff we're thinking about. But the key is to growing these teams is Thursday afternoon at four o'clock. I look out there right now, how many of you know what happens at four o'clock on Thursday afternoon? What happens? Doug presents the model. Doug presents the model. I do not, I talk to people. I talked to somebody this morning at 8 a.m. I had a call. I told them about the first pillar, hey, we're cloud-based by design. I told them that we're a broker. We have all the shiny objects and everything. And I told them about our training and education, which is very unique for a broker. But I said, the fourth pillar is controversial. And I'll tell you what, will you check out the model explained with Doug, with me on Thursday at four o'clock? He does a half hour model explained because if I tell somebody about it, I'm gonna throw up all over them and they're gonna go, that's a pyramid scheme, Pitt. When Doug, a third party, explains what's going on, it adds such legitimacy to what we're doing. So use the system of the week to your advantage. Leverage it because you have people that are putting in the time. Now the question is, are you smart enough to bring people there? So I'm gonna hit my 15 retail branches because every one of those branch managers is gonna go. And then they're gonna see how legitimate we are and they're gonna meet the other people. And trust me, Doug shows up every time with a lot of energy. And so that's how we're gonna do it. Now, going back to the why, you still yeah, take that away. You know, my why, Robert actually sold me on the why, right? So, I mean, I'm looking at making, you know, let's say 500K as a producer versus 500K as a builder, right? And I look, and I've been in the spot of making big money as a producer, right? But the pressure on you constantly to be available, to, to be pushing things and putting out fires is big, right? And I, uh, it's difficult to take a vacation when you're closing 180 deals in a year. It's just hard, right? Because you're on all the time. And when you're new and you're hungry, you want that problem. But when you're sitting in that problem for years, you start to think maybe there's a different lifestyle that I want to choose. Same income level, maybe even more, but a different lifestyle. 
And then I, I worked with Robert for, for three years, right? And Robert's my broker, right? He's my branch manager. He's the guy that was making a percentage of all my production for the past four years together. And I think I've maybe called Robert five times in the three years, four years that we've been working together with a loan question. But Robert's making money every time I close a deal. I'm working the 10, 12 hours a day, grinding it out, and Robert's making money every time I close a deal. And I'm like, man, I want to sit in that seat, right? That's a cool seat to sit in. I, and that's about lifestyle, right? That's about being able to go on a nice vacation and unplug, like truly unplug. Because grinding for three or four years, I didn't really have that opportunity a whole lot. And now that's something I crave more. So it's okay to chase the 500K as a producer, but you sit here long enough and you start to realize the smarter money and the money that allows you to have more of the type of lifestyle you want is gonna be found in growing the team. And that's why our goals are more towards team growth now um, and more about maintaining what we have on the production because production is great. And the majority of my income still comes from my production. So I'm not about to say no to that, right? That's a machine that's gonna keep going. But I'm looking at these checks I'm getting from my team and I'm like, dang, that's easy money, right? I feel like my production money is my blood money. I blood, sweat, and tears. I was trying to tear that out. But the production money just kind of shows up every week. It's amazing, right? I'm like, dude, I want more of that. That's amazing. So that's really the, it's lifestyle. That's my why, is I want a different lifestyle. Awesome. Right. Well, hey, I appreciate everybody showing up. 2022 is going to be a great year for us. Thanks, Doug, Pitt, John, Robert. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. Thank you guys.